Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hello and welcome to Grilling JR. This is Paul Bromwell and I'm joined by the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. JR, how are you this week? I'm good. I'm good, Paul. Thanks for sitting in for uh, the big boy. He's taking care of business. You know, he's, he's uh, ubiquitous. He's everywhere and he's quite the entrepreneur. So Conrad, whatever you're doing, hope it's successful and uh, I'll, we'll, we'll rejoin each other soon. He's a busy big boy. You can say yeah. that again, my friend. Come on. You're busy as well, Jim, all over the place between dynamite, uh, full gear, lots going on in the AEW world, lots going on in wrestling. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So for good, good news for some folks and not so good for others. You're referring, I am assuming to the AE, the, uh, WWE layoffs. I, I am. I, I have to ask you, I wanted to talk to you about this before we get into, uh, this week is, is Chris Jericho 2001, but. I wanted to talk to you specifically about some of this that's been going on, especially the last year you sat in the chair, talent relations have had lots of difficult decisions over the years, but we have never seen anything like we have in wrestling in terms of releases like we have over the last 12 to 16 months. Well, you know, when you become a public company, it changes the, the, uh, ground rules, uh, throughout the, that, that, whatever the said company. And, uh, you know, they're, even though they had a huge profit, uh, which is congratulations to them, but, um, uh, it was bad timing. I thought to come off the heels of a big announcement that, uh, announced, uh, great profitability, uh, in the third quarter. And now, uh, on the heels minutes after uh, you're finding out a lot of talents and, and some, all of them are, you know, good soldiers, just, uh, just, uh, their name came up and you know what the, what the criteria is, uh, is it creative? Is it uh, issues that we're not aware of? Is it simply budgetary? Have some people overstayed their welcome? You know, I don't have a clue. I know that for all of them that, uh, got let go, uh, they should not perceive this as the end of the world because it sure as hell isn't. There's just no way that you could frame that and say, well, it's you know, yeah, that's what we're going to do now, honey. Christmas is here. We don't have any, you know, if you ran your budget that close or you've got no, uh, you know, no, no little, little stash of cash nest egg. Yeah. And ha after being, wor after working full time, you're not spending it on a lot of, uh, uh travel and P and a T and E or T and a any other, uh, value you want to throw in there, but you're not, you're, you're you're, you're able to save some money and you're, and you're not working, you know, five days a week. So you should be able to save some money on your trance that wasn't picked up by the company. And, uh, I just don't believe that uh, any of those talents should be thinking that I guess my run in wrestling is over. It's only going to be over if that is your choice. If your choice is that, well, you know, I don't know, then you maybe 
you may have your own answers. Maybe it's not that important anymore. And you're willing to go do something else and explore other opportunities. I don't know that, but I know that, uh, one of the questions I used to ask talents all the time is what is your plan B? And if they had no plan B and they gave me the old line about, uh, I love wrestling and this is all I've ever wanted to do. And I'm living my dream. If I get to you know, get a contract with, with, with you, Jr. blah, blah, blah. Uh, I used to question them on that. Because here's what happens. You get into the process to this, uh, person that has one goal and that is to be on you know, WWE television. And if things don't work out, sometimes people take, make stupid mistakes to try to rectify it. Uh, and are they they're they, they become less of a team player. They're disappointed in the system. They're disappointed in what has happened. So the bottom line is, it's just up to all those individuals. Some of them can take time to work on their bodies. Some of them could take time to heal. Uh, you know, God forbid they may want to spend more time with their family. And there is this little thing called the holidays coming up in December. Mm -hmm. So I feel badly for them. I sound like I might not, but I've been in this position and I always never went into the next day saying, what are we going to do? I always prepared for those rainy days. I'm a businessman. And so, uh, and I think that's what, how they need to, for my feedback, that's what I would look at. Take this time to better yourself, you know, get bigger, stronger, faster, uh, rest, uh, clear your head and be with your family, common sense things. But I can tell you this getting cut from the WWE or AEW or any other company, including companies called the national football league, you cause you get cut. Doesn't mean it's over. And I hope that they can, a lot of them that listen, and I know a lot do, you know, I feel for you, but, uh, don't put yourself in a, you know, don't jump down the rabbit hole and say, I get, I'm just go, I'm going to just get away from everything. I need time. Okay. If you need time, take time, mm. but don't get up the next morning thinking, I just don't know what I'm going to do. This is horrible. Yes. It's horrible, but get over it, get over it and move forward and prove yourself. And, and try to regroup because there's a lot of folks doing wrestling right now. And if you're ready and willing and able, and you're a good, you're a good locker room person and all that stuff, you know, what the hell, I, give that a shot. Something else is going to come around. So the, that, like I said, that's the main message I would give them. I don't know why a lot of those people were cut. I, I like some better than others. just like anybody else. I'm not going to name any names, but if there's a place for them in AEW, I'm sure that will be explored. I don't know. I stopped my area That's Tony Khan's area. And I don't, I don't try to edge my way into that piece of the business. I was there for a long time and I don't care to be back in that role again. It's just too much stress and pressure and Tony's young and you know, he, he's got control of his ship, man. He ain't got to call somebody to get a, uh, can I sign this guy for X? Can I get this? Uh, can I get a hundred thousand dollar bonus check signing bonus, all those things. He does what he needs to do that he feels is right for AEW. So we're lucky we have him. And uh, I'm sure some of those folks, I'm not sure, but I would assume strongly assume that some will get a shot at, in, in AEW sometime in 2022, I'm guessing that, but I can sure see some fun things happening with some of the folks that will, will be available, uh, in that, in that time. Yeah. Some have already come out with positive statements and, you know, it's time to turn the page and, but I think it's good to hear from you, someone who's sat in that chair for in different positions, whether you're the one who's who had to move people out of certain roles in wrestling or it's happened to you too. And there is life. You're out to, to tell them there's life on the other side. And even though the wounds are fresh, uh, now is the time to start preparing and thinking about, Hey, I'm what, what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to prove the doubters wrong, you know, yeah, get, be get better. That's right. Prove your skill set. And it's a very cosmetic business. So get yourself in the greatest shape you've been in work on your cardio, spend time with your family, uh, you know, take, take your wife or your significant other Christmas shopping or, or whatever, uh, do things that are normal. And, uh, and, but all the, all the while, when you have that time, those windows of opportunity, uh, improve your game, get better at what you do. And, but if you're going to, if, if nothing changes, then how do you expect change to occur in your career and your life? If you're not willing to change and make and make things better, you know, what the world is looking for, you know, what's important on television, look, 
athleticism, being in condition. And now somebody's going to say, well, you can point out uh, exceptions to all the things I've said. I can only tell you from my own experience of having to let a lot of people go in my career, never fund the thing and experiencing it myself. You know, I I've been replaced. Uh, I got replaced one time on raw, uh, when, uh, I think we're in Waco where my Sooners play this Saturday in Waco, going to be a tough game too. Uh, and they told me before the show, and I, Kevin Dunn advanced. I said, you know, you guys are, I, I got your way of doing things and that's your call, but I find it pretty stupid. You're telling your lead announcer he's done before his last show. Would it have hurt you to let me have a clear head on the show tonight? And, uh, you know, then after the show's over, call me into your little cubby hole and say, you're done, but that's not how it worked out. Which I didn't think it was good timing, but it happened. I lived through it. I made it home. I drove home. I remember driving home, talking to Jan on the telephone, uh, a lot of the way. So she thought I was kidding at first because why would they do that? I don't know why they do a lot of things. It was just, it was time for a change. I think that was during the time that they were trying to hire Mike Goldberg mm. of uh, USC and, uh, that never got off the ground. Yeah, really see how that worked out. Well, he got, he yeah. got good advice from Mark Ratner, the hall of fame, uh, MMA guy, one of my best buddies, one of the finest men I've ever met. And, uh, I think Goldberg quiz Mark about it because Mark's a big fan. He's former chairman of the Nevada state athletic commission. So he had a lot of t- interactions with pro wrestling. He said, you're, you're, you're following somebody you can't follow. Hmm. This is not your thing. And, and you're going to be hated because you're going to be the, the chosen one now in the eyes of Vince and people aren't going to like you. And, uh, I, I don't say that in a braggadocious way, cause I don't wish that on anybody, but the bottom line is Mark was right. And Goldberg took his advice and they, uh, went to plan B. So anyway, it's just one of those things. It's life part of life, man. You know, I don't, I don't like dealing with this skin cancer. I don't like dealing with that either, but that's the hand I've been dealt. And the, the only thing I can do is to get uh, healthy and go through all the, ch- all the procedures to, uh, ensure that can happen. I know on the 22nd of November, I'm having uh, two, I have they, the doctor found two more, uh, places on my back mm. and he's going to cut those out in one appointment. And then uh, earlier in the day, I'll have gone to my cancer doctor and, uh, they had to build a boot for me to, to do the radiation accurately, which I'm all for. And, uh, so it's two different processes. One is my back, two places on my back. I didn't know I had, uh, and the other is that the big one on my, that's on my ankle. And ironically, uh, the one of my ankles healing up real well, it's just, it's almost, you still see that there's an issue, but it doesn't look as gross mm. and as gruesome as it, when I, sh- I, uh, displayed that picture, which I wish I had not done and quite honestly, but, uh, I, I did, I would believe in sharing with the fans. Right. And maybe to, to a faulty degree, to be honest with you. So I got a big month in November, you know, it's gotta be an aggressive month and and I, unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I'm going to, I, I really, I wanted to, as I said earlier, Paul, I wanted to make sure I could still do my, my stuff. I'll know more about that after, uh, November 22, but you know, if I can, I got to put my health first. I speak I got, on behalf of the wrestling fans. We want Jr. to focus on Jr. I think that's the right thing to do. Yes, sir. Ego wise. You know, I, I, people say, are you worried about, you know, getting replaced? No, hell no. I work for Tony Khan. I work for a different man than I worked for in the past. And he has been nothing but, uh, amazing in this whole process to the point of whatever you need, we'll take care of you. Mm. And, uh, you know, whatever you need to do to keep, get you healthy again, that's what we'll, you know, we're, 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 we're ready to take every step of the way with you. And the irony of this is that unlike a lot of wrestling bosses, I believe him. I trust him and, uh, that I can't tell you how much that takes a load off your chest where I can go back and focus on the, the business. I love is pro wrestling. 
So that's where I am on that. Those couple of matters, you know, it's, it's just a battle. You got to fight, man. And I, I, ain't, I don't need no woe is me. I don't need to feel, anybody feeling sorry. I don't need a, I don't need a, a GoFundMe page. I don't need a, any of that stuff. Thank God. But I'm damn sure, uh, I'm, I'm going to fight this with everything I got and uh, get through these radiation treatments and, and, uh, hopefully just move on about my business. And it may be time real good because I know we're going to TVS in, in January. Mm. I'd really like to be, uh, good to go by January and, and back in the announce booth. And it may not, I may not miss it many shows at all. I don't know yet. And if somebody can't figure that out, well, why don't you know, we need to know. <laughs> I've got to know. Oh my God. Well, the deal is I don't, I've never had radiation. Right. I don't know. Again, brand new be, going through this. Oh yeah. So I got to figure out how I'm going to feel. Yeah. And am I going to be able to, if I can't do my work to the level that I am comfortable with, there's no way in hell I'm going to force that on the fans. But when I get full of piss and vinegar and I get healthy, watch out. So that's where we are with those two items. Oh, uh, well, JR, no, it sounds, listen, you have a lot on your plate. You're busy. You got a lot going on. You're doing a lot of traveling. We're going to hear you this weekend at full gear Yeah, and, uh, excited yeah, to hear you on the show, call there. Yeah. Hell of a card, but, yeah. uh, Tony booked a great card for that show. And I think we've done a nice job of building to it. The TVs that were in, uh, in the Indianapolis television, I'm sure, uh, uh, all the shows this week. Rampage on Friday should be hot as hell. Mm. I thought our show, uh, I thought our dynamites have been excellent. Uh, and then you got that pay-per-view that we've been building. It seemed like we've been building that pay-per-view for weeks and weeks and weeks. I'm very anxious to get to it. And I think Tony's booked a hell of a card. It's up and down the card. There's matches that could theoretically steal the show mm. and, and knowing how, how competitive our locker room is, uh, it's just like, well, I, nothing's going to follow that. And here comes the next match. And well, I got to rephrase that. I didn't think anybody would follow it, but it seems like this one is. And, and then, then what you have is at the end of the night, here's a great challenge that people got to remember how good can Omega and hangman and page be closing the show after the fans have seen great effort and an am amazing athletic athleticism. Uh, a great wrestling card. How do they follow all of that and take us home with a, uh, a, a main event match that people won't soon forget. It's almost sounds impossible to accomplish, but knowing Omega and page, I don't think so. Uh, they both are in different points, of their career. They both are at different places. Uh, a win for page is huge for his career. It creates another superstar, super, superstar in 80 AEW. Uh, Omega's a made man. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting, it's going to be an interesting Saturday night. So if you, if you can't be in Minneapolis, if you are bring your coat, cause I damn sure am. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and enjoy it on pay-per-view. It's just going to be, I can't see this show not having, not being excellent. Yeah. And I know I'm biased and I work for the company and they pay me, but I'm just being honest with you, looking at the, the, the psychological matchups. Not only from a theatrical standpoint, but from a professional standpoint and a personal standpoint, I think that this is, uh, this show is damn near and can't miss. How good can it be? It's what I'm wondering. How good can it be? And I can't wait to get after it. Well, when you think about Daniel, Brian Danielson, Miro, you think about CM Punk and, uh, he's going to be taking on Eddie Kingston. You think FTR is on the card? I mean, there's a lot, a lot there. A lot, so. of, a lot of good stuff, man. Yes, sir. A lot of good stuff. So. <clears throat> Tony's booked the hell of a card. Uh, I'm sure all Tony Shivani and uh, Excalibur and myself would try to ha do it justice. So it's all good, man. I'm, I'm going to have a great week and then uh, we'll take it from there. There you go. That's all you can do. Jr. That's all you yeah. can do is just take it one day at a time, buddy. And know that you're, uh, you're in a lot of people's thoughts and prayers. And we're glad to hear that you're, uh, in the right headspace. And you talked about a lot of stars, a lot of AEW folks, and we're here to talk today about another one, a key piece in AEW. You and Connie just talked about this man from his 1999 and 2000 a few weeks ago, and we're going to talk about his 2001 this week, and that is Chris Jericho. 
man, 20 years ago, and he's still getting it done. And by the way, this week, JR, his birthday, 51 on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, as this drops on Thursday, Tuesday the 9th, he turned 51 years old. That's man. awesome. That's all. Well, he, you know, Christy stays in good shape. Uh, he's got the mental game down. That's the, that's one of the great advantages that he has over his peers is that Jericho understands in-ring psychology and he'll have to use all of it because he's got a cast of thousands in his match at, at full <laughs> gear. And, and, uh, you, you know, yep. you're always anxious to see how the newbies are going to do. I, I'm anxious to see how junior dos Santos working punch relates to everybody else. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. When the, when the adrenaline start pop, pumping and you got a guy that doesn't have any experience doing that, you know, sometimes just tough to hold back. Right. When that energy is going. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he's always, always been known as one of the great strikers in USC history, great knockout power. So who knows what's going to happen, but, uh, Chrissy's work will be cut out because I, I believe that this has been his brainchild. So he's, I know, and here's what I know. I know he's got a vision for it. I never ask him what he's going to do because I'm as much of a fan as anybody else. I like for him or the match to evolve and let me call the evolution of what I'm, what I'm seeing. I think it's better for the fans. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not an actor. Uh, I'm, you know, I like to say I'm a pretty good storyteller, but I'm a play by play guy. And, uh, so I don't look at myself as an actor. I saw something Michael Hope Cole said, and he's right. You know, he's the, he's an actor in a, in a scripted sport in WWE. And he's, uh, you know, he's there to add a little sizzle, mm. but, uh, the, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm in that world, but I'm not. We, t we and I have a place at, at the fork in the road where we take a different turn. It doesn't mean my route is more fortuitous than his. It simply means that I don't have to share his philosophy, which is cool. I, you know, I like Michael. He's a good friend and he's a good guy. And I saw where he was losing his hearing. Yes. And I can, I can understand that, but really that's, that touches home too. Mm. So anyway, it's a Jericho is a special guy. And this year is 2020 is 2001. It was uh, pretty sensational for him. Yeah, and as a storyteller, we're going to try to tell the story, you and I, of 2001. It was a big year for him between the alliance and how he rounded out the end of the year. That'll be our go-home as the undisputed champion. But let's let's try to work together, and we're going to tell the story of Jericho together from 2001. And it all started with him working with Perry Saturn at a house show in Anaheim, California in January of that year before heading to New York and Madison Square Garden where he took part in a celebrity hockey game and in a tribute to his father. JR, talk about his relationship uh, with his father, Ted, and how big of a deal do you think this was for Chris getting this opportunity to play in a celebrity game at Madison Square Garden? Well, we had to get that cleared. You know, I, I, I know that I talked to Vince about that. We were, you know, the, the concerns always somebody getting hurt. Uh, but I explained to Vince, and I think Vince fully understood how important it was for Chris as a son to be a part of this, uh, homage to his dad, who was mm. a, an enforcer in the NHL and a noted one. Uh, so, you know, we, we blessed the opportunity. And I think if we had not, he'd have played anyway, because he really wanted to be there for this tribute to his father. And I cannot blame him. His dad was a very respected NHL player. Uh, and you know, Chris born in long Island when, when his dad was a member of the Rangers. Uh, so, you know, it was a interesting time, but, uh, it also showed his athlete. We got some great footage from that. And we, he has, uh, Chris had, he showed his athleticism. I mean, the son of a gun can skate and he likes contact. He's a chip off the old block. He just took his aggression and his creativity into another venue. So that's how that started. And we knew that he was a special guy and, and the crowd was in favor, you know, was, was, uh, supporting him. So it was, it was fun to see him be able to do that. And we were all impressed with his athleticism that day, uh, far, far away from a wrestling ring. Well, Jr. we kick off January in, in typical WWE, WWF fashion with Royal Rumble. It's in New Orleans in 2001. It's Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho 
And they come together to deliver one of the classic ladder matches of all time. And I want you to hear this. This is from The Observer. Dave Meltzer said, Chris Jericho won the Intercontinental title from Chris Benoit in a ladder match in 18 minutes, 44 seconds. It started with a lot of good mat wrestling before any ladder involvement. Benoit later put the cross face on Jericho, who tapped like crazy, which basically guaranteed he was going over at the end. Benoit missed a diving headbutt off the top of the ladder. Jericho was climbing. Benoit was lying nearly underneath the ladder and from the ground tipped it over and sent Jericho flying all the way over the top rope. Benoit was climbing, and this time Jericho shoved the ladder, and Benoit went over the top. And this time it gave Jericho the chance to climb the ladder and get the belt. He gave this one four and three quarter stars. How about it's, that? It's an insane performance, maybe one of the best one on one ladder matches of all time, but it's been wiped from everybody's memory, unfortunately, because of Benoit. What did you think right. of, the, of, of the match, Jim? I think they would have had a, a, a classic match, no matter the stipulations. I've often wondered how that match would have been just a clean, you know, catch as catch can, uh, physically intense match without the gimmicks. Uh, but it gives the boys some, t some toys to play with. Uh, and so I'm not ridiculing it whatsoever. Uh, I've called a lot of great ladder matches, uh, luckily for me, uh, and you know, with Dudley's and edge and Christian and the Hardys among others. But those three come to mind, those three teams, uh, I, I think they had a classic match no matter what they did. Mm. So I was really excited about that. And you're right about the Benoit snut, the people avoiding Benoit. I understand that I'm not spending what he, what Chris did last few hours of his life to him and his, certainly his family. Uh, so, and that was on my watch and it was hard to navigate because I know I went to Benoit's, uh, I went to Nancy, I went to Nancy and, uh, Daniel's funeral hmm. in Florida with one, with a less than a day's notice. And, uh, I got there late because the flight, you know, so I walk in the damn, the uh, funeral home and church, whatever. And I was not too welcome because the WWE had, you know, it had bad, had bad vibes. Sure. For those people that lost their little, little boy and lost the Nancy. <laughs> so, uh, it was tough. So, but I'm glad that, uh, at least we can talk about it. Mm. We can show anything we want on this network. The adfree.com network will show you a lot of things. And I'm sure in, as time moves on, you know, all, all of our adfreeshows.com team, uh, will be offering a, a lot of cool things, but, uh, we're not going to ignore Chris Benoit. We're not going to, we're not going to put a hero banner on him. That's right. But as a wrestler, you know, I've said this before, you know, and I, some people agree and some people don't, which is kind of the, the charm of the show. I don't get pissed off. If you don't agree with me. Uh, I'm not going to go on social media and lambast you because we don't share the same opinion. How stupid is that? Uh, but anyway, uh, I, 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 I just, I said this before that Chris had a hall of fame wrestling career, but the last 48 hours or so of his life, pretty much. And unfortunately erased that. And I think if he were able to respond to the question, Chris, do you believe you belong in the hall of fame? He would say no, because he knows that they, if he was involved in a induction, that would be the focal point, And that would be taking the eye off the important stuff. I believe that's how you look at it. So, uh, the boy, they, they turned it loose Two Canadian kids, you know, an Edmonton boy and Chris and, and our, excuse me. And, uh, oh, well, Chris Benoit yeah. and, and then, and then Jericho was from Winnipeg. So they had a lot of national pride and they, they wanted, I don't know how in the hell you follow that stuff. It's a brutal match and I, I, and I can't help it. I mean, there's a lot of chair shots, ladder shots, flying headbots, headbutts. It's one of those things too, where knowing how the end of the story was written at this point, when you go back and watch some of these matches now, you're like, no wonder there was so much head trauma and damage when you see some of the style that was going yeah. on back then for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, that chair shots to the head are totally unnecessary in today's game. With all the information we have about uh, concussions, 
you know, our uh, one kid I signed out of Harvard, Chris Nowinski. Yes. It's making a living and trying to help people with uh, post concussion syndrome and, and all the other ancillary things that go along with it. And he's doing a great job. He's a fine human being. He suffered from the same thing. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, there's just no reason for that in, the, in, in any game, but we've learned through medicine that, uh, it's not necessary. The bookers, the talents have to be more creative. Do you have to use a chair to make your match work? I say no. And so, uh, you know, you send if somebody comes to you with that formula, you send them back to the, where they came from and say, figure out something without the chair, come back to see me. Mm. Well, this match would certainly set the tone for Jericho for what would lie ahead of him this year. He would go from winning the Intercontinental title here at the Rumble to putting over the Big Show, who, by the way, returned at the 2001 Royal Rumble. And uh, it was Big Show, Kurt Angle, and uh, there was a number one contenders match for the WWF title and a four-way with The Rock. Jericho and Benoit have a classic ladder match, and in two weeks, Jericho doesn't win another match. I know Bruce has said it over and over again that wins and losses don't matter, but that has to be frustrating for the talent. I'm sure. Well, Bruce and I don't, don't agree on that point. Uh, but that doesn't mean Bruce is wrong. You know, I don't want to hurt Conrad's feelings. Or You're not going to go to Twitter about it. No, okay. I'm not going to go to Twitter, uh, at J R S B B Q here. <laughs> I want to follow, uh, appreciate the follows, but yeah, I, I, uh, I just don't, I just. That match was brutal yeah, and it, it's cringe worthy, but it's a, it's the most, it's gruesome art. Benoit versus Jericho was, was gruesome art in my he, view. He is, uh, he's moving slower. It's reported in the observer that it's from the ladder match and his back's bothering him, uh, but he's not missing any dates here. Jr. Uh, it's important for him to keep going at this point, right? Just, just trying to work through it. I guess at this he's point, he's finally got to a place where he can build momentum. Uh, and see where it, see where and how it culminates. The last thing a wrestler wants to do is to, uh, take the bat out of their own hands and step out of the lineup. And, uh, Chris was not in favor of that. But the other thing too, is that we would not have let him be in the ring. If he had been quote unquote damaged goods and was just teetering on a, uh, being, uh, medically, right. if he had, if he, if, if he had not been able to be cleared medically. The bottom line, it came to this, how much pain can you withstand? And so that showed me early on, I, I knew, I thought I knew, but it was proven to me without a shadow of a doubt that Chris Jericho is one of the toughest guys that the WWE's ever had. And subsequently he's always been that way. He's that way now. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying is there's a difference between aches and pains and right. a major injury. Correct. You know, yeah, we didn't hide any injuries. Would not allow that to happen. He was too bad on a piece of talent. And that's just not the way you treat another human being, no matter if you're in a pro rational business or what, or sports entertainment. It just, you don't treat a human being that way. And because they're like wild horses, man, somebody was the best advice. Somebody told me, I can't remember who it was, uh, that, you know, these guys are like these horses, the wild horses are out on the in Montana places like that, where they're still running wild. Uh, and that's what they are and they, they can't be managed. They can't be wrangled. So it's just, it's tough. You gotta, you gotta try to help them with that problem if, if you can. Well, Jr. as we move from January into February, Eddie Guerrero returns to the WWF and hits Chris with a frog splash to what seems to begin a program. And then at SmackDown, Jericho loses to triple H after Guerrero interferes. Your intercontinental champion isn't exactly getting a lot of wins here. Does that weaken him in your eyes? Yeah. Yeah. He, he had a short build and, uh, it should have been longer. I think in hindsight, certainly, but, uh, you know, that's how the booking went and it, a lot of that booking ran through triple H mm. he was, uh, he had, he had a lot of influence and he's also very good. Uh, you know, the Eddie Jericho program, you, you have to ask yourself this question Would the Eddie Jericho program have been better. If the centerpiece of their angle and the heart and soul of that angle was a championship, like the intercontinental title, or are those guys so good that they could make a great program without it? Yeah. That's always a question it could be, it could be debated. There's no right answer. I don't, I don't think, uh, either way it's going to work, but, uh, I, I, uh, jerk, there's a questionable booking in the, this 20, 
2001. There is. We'll talk about it. Yeah, I mean, well, because then next on Raw, he goes on to take Eddie Guerrero on again. X-Pac runs in, interferes. As to your point, there really doesn't seem to be a program. Jericho's just kind of floating around the card at this point. So uh, just interesting uh, storyline and, I guess, storytelling not really happening right now for Jericho, just all over the place. Right. Well, he still is that, <coughs> believe it or not, he's still in that, uh, uh, I got to prove myself stage, especially with the, with the, with the, uh, with Vince and company, you know, again, that he was not, he was not their idea to hire mm. and he went six feet. Uh, so he was, uh, he still was in that building process. And, and so he kind of just got in that lane and kept chugging and grinding away. I hope to get recognized as a, as one of the top hands in the entire wrestling business. Well, without a major storyline, we are up to no way out and we're going to do a four way for the intercontinental title. And it's against it's Jericho, Benoit, X-Pac and Eddie Guerrero, which is like four super workers in a match, yep. All right. you know, just to make the card, I guess the, as best as possible here. Another good match. You're just looking for a great performance. Yes. Uh, and it got all those guys booked. It got them all the pay sheet. Uh, all those things are important to them. And it certainly was important to me as well. Uh, so they all got paid well. And like I said, I thought, I thought that match is pretty damn, pretty damn strong. Yeah. From the observer, uh, Dave would say Chris Jericho retained the intercontinental title over Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit and X-Pac. It went 12 minutes, 18 seconds. They tease Benoit and Guerrero joining forces. So of course they end up turning on each other, presumably <laughs> to start a program to turn Benoit face. Lots of near falls and saves. Just incredible helped out X-Pac and took a great bump when Benoit knocked him off the apron. Uh, Jer Jericho got the walls on everyone, and finally Credible came out with X-Pac in the walls. Benoit did a dragon suplex on Jericho for a near fall. Jericho did the lion salt on Guerrero for a near fall. X-Pac did an X-Factor on Jericho, but Benoit broke it up. Benoit had the cross face on X-Pac, but uh, Guerrero broke it up. You get the gist here. It ended up with Jericho doing a rolling reverse cradle on X Pac for the win. Three and a quarter, three and a half stars from Dave. Uh, again, four super talented guys just going yeah. at it for a strong, strong match there. Just incredible though, Jr. It's a name I haven't heard much uh, talked about on this podcast. This is around his debut after ECW closes. What was it about Justin that just didn't click with the WWF audience? Uh. He had, he had substance abuse issues, simple as that. And, uh, was running with the wrong crowd in the wrong lane. It was never anything about Justin's, uh, uh, inability to work. He was a, he's an excellent worker, but he, he was, he shot himself in the feet too many times to keep running. And, uh, and I, I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, he's clean and sober now. Yes. And, uh, which I think is a. That's the biggest victory of all Fantastic. for him. Yeah. So always a good kid, lifelong fan. I got a lot of time for him. Good boy. And, and, uh, I wish his, some of his issues had been, uh, under control more and it probably would have resulted in him having a long, longer, more profitable career in WWE and subsequently there on. Well, Jr. this was a good match. And as they say, it was short on time, but heavy on talent. And, uh, the WWF at this time had an abundance of riches. Wouldn't you say talent wise? I mean, they have a stacked roster around this time. Yeah. Uh, I think the, uh, the recruiting and the signing and the motivation and all the stuff that we try to do as a team talent relations was paying off dividends. That roster was about as good as I've ever seen 2001. And, uh, you know, gosh, almighty, we just, we were loaded. Mm. You had to, you had to try to screw that up and that's, it's, uh, you can do it, <laughs> yeah. uh, but nonetheless, it was, uh, we were loaded with talent and those guys made all of us look good. Well, Jr. Chris Benoit quits the radicals when he calls Eddie an intercontinental title match against Jericho by hitting Benoit with the headbutt. in your mind, was it time to kind of separate Benoit from the radicals here? Well, if Chris wanted to get to this destination, eventually he's going to have to be uh, solitary man to, to some degree at that time, arguable, you know, you, you could have got more mileage, solidified the, 
the relationship. Therefore, when it broke up, it would have meant more. I thought the booking was a little rushed, but nonetheless, it was it was a it, it was a disastrous. But you certainly could have got more out of it than we did by letting it grow a little bit more. Well, Jim, I got a smile on my face because we're finally about to tell a story between two performers as we're going to build the WrestleMania and it's Jericho and William Regal. And my goodness, it starts off at Monday on Monday night, raw on March 19th, when Jericho enters the office of William Regal and he has to go to the bathroom. I'm talking number one and it, and he happens to find William Regal's tea kettle. Uh Oh, and, uh, this has Vince McMahon written all over it. I mean, Regal's. you know that <laughs> Regal's reaction is priceless. Uh, he, he, he drinks the tea and, and his reaction is, wow, that's tart. Yeah. We even it, get Harvey Wimpleman in the skit. Uh, Regal. Well, I've said this before the show. I, I, there are very few guys in pro wrestling that I've met uh, and developed relationships with that. I don't value, that I value more than William Regal. AKA Darren Matthews who's an invaluable asset for WWE. And it would be for any company that he chose to, uh, uh, hang his hat. And, uh, he's such a, was a good sport. Mm. His facial expressions were priceless and it shows you how much you can get over by, by learning the subtleties and perfecting the subtleties. We talked about all that big list of 18 people that got released. Uh, they need to watch a lot of their work their own work and they need to see how they can improve in the transitions from offense to defense, uh, maybe their finishing hold, uh, how they navigate a near fall, all those things. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we Regal's a, he's a star that's never got his due as much as I believe he deserves. The story would move on and there's an angle that Jericho is a part of that I bring up because Chris talked about this with Conrad. Uh, when he hosted the talk is Jericho pod podcast, it's from Cleveland, the night that WWF bought WCW. And here's what Chris had to say about it to Conrad from talk is Jericho. And, and by the way, this is when Jericho dresses up as doink and attacks, uh, William Regal in a ring. And this is what Chris had to say. He said, this is Shawn Michaels before he went away for the last time and really got cleaned up. He was at the venue. He was just out of his mind. And he's like, Hey, they got you playing doink now. And I'm like, no, it's just for the night. He goes, no, I don't like it. It's terrible gimmick. Don't play doink. Yeah. yeah it's okay. Sean. It's just for tonight. Don't do it, man. It's going to kill your career. Oh, don't God. let them make you into doink. And How then he walked, is that? I know. And then he walked Good. away. He couldn't grasp the fact that I was just dressing up as doink for one freaking night. Well, you know. You also could say that Sean saw the writing on the wall, that there's, there's, there may be a new sheriff riding into town Ooh. and uh, the, uh, and same size, basically smaller, great performer. I'm not saying that's the way it was, but, uh, sometimes the, the bigger, the star, the bigger, the ego, mm. the bigger, the star, usually, uh, the more insecurities that you find. And to say that Sean wasn't insecure at times because of his, uh, substance abuse issues would be a lie. Is Sean Michael still one of the great, was he one of the greatest ever without a doubt? You know, I don't know if he's better than flair. I, I wouldn't say so in my view, Flair's still the number one guy in my eyes, but if it's not, it's not flair, there's a one a there and it's very clearly Sean Michaels. So there's an agenda. Here's what I'm saying. Sean didn't blast Jericho's portrayal of doink as a kindness to help Sean or help, or excuse me, help, uh, uh, Chris, uh, uh, navigate these waters. There was an agenda there and, uh, which we, none of us can prove it's all subjective. Well, and here let's add another wrinkle to this story, this story night in Cleveland where Vince purchases WCW. Also what happened that night later on, this is the night that Sean passes out in Vince's office later on as Jericho would write in his book and had to be sent home, by the way, that's, that's, uh, it kind of confirms his advice was, uh, provided or given in a altered state. There you so, go. 
you know, and, and the direct culprit of that may have been just simply the, the pills, or it may have been ego. There's a lot of factors at play, but to say that Sean was going out of his way to help Jericho out of this booking a conundrum would not be on my list No. So once again, WWF purchases WCW huge moment in time for the wrestling business. And one of the major moments uh, that's talked about for the demise of WCW was Chris Jericho leaving and signing with the WWF. Looking back, there's always a lot of things that people can pinpoint to for the ending of WCW, but does the Jericho signing stand out in your mind, Jr. as one of the big pivotal moments for them for WCW? Yeah, losing I don't him. know. You know, they, they had a lot of talent. They were underutilized in some people's eyes. Uh, it certainly didn't do them any favors, but you know, until I, I read that somewhere, maybe in this script or, or going over the notes and stuff, uh, I, I never recruited Chris Jericho in that famous, uh, meeting with Jerry Briscoe and I meeting Chris at the Bombay bicycle club to Tampa in the hopes that's going to disrupt WCW. That's not the right way to recruit. I was trying to hire a guy that could help us. He could play. He could play offense. He could play defense. He could play special teams. Mm. He could talk. He could do wrestle. He could brawl. He could do everything. So that's where I was with that deal. I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it had to, the, it was a big turning point and that's not, not, and that's not denigrating the skills of Chris and WCW, but in WCW, it didn't look as if Paul, that he was going to be utilized to his full ability. And that, that's, that's what brought him to us. That's what he wanted out. And we, and I took yeah. I took advantage of that uh, situation and, and, uh, and we were able to get him signed, which uh, one of the best signings that I ever did. Our team ever did, you know, Jerry Briscoe's right there too. And Jerry was a very respected guy and Jericho's a fan of the business. And if you're a fan of pro wrestling, you sure as hell have a good working knowledge of the Briscoe brothers. Mm. Uh, and, uh, I'm not knocking the, the ECW Briscoe brothers. I kind of thought they're kind of cool, but, uh, the Jerry and Jack Briscoe were famous. They're folk heroes. They were hall of famers. Everybody loved the Briscoes. They love their style. There was no smoother wrestler in the world that I ever saw than, uh, Jack Briscoe. Uh, so all the boys took something from the Briscoes, uh, over time. And so for Jerry to sit there and to answer questions and all these things, uh, was a blessing for us on that day. So, uh, I don't think, I don't think it was a, I don't think it was a big issue as far as it, as it relates to the longevity of WCW, it never hurts or helps you rather to lose a star, but quite frankly, you go back and look at that roster about that time and they were still loaded. Yeah, but you got to wonder, Jr. And I'm interested in your opinion of this because I've heard some some you know others opinions that have been out there. The focus it seemed like for WCW was more of the established stars, the Hogans, the Nashes, the Halls, and what slipped through the cracks and came to WWE was the Jerichos, the Guerreros, the Benoits, the Rey Mysterios, and to me, those guys were the future uh, of, of the promotion. They were. That, that's not a mystery. Yeah. And you don't have to be the pro wrestling valedictorian to ascertain that that's the correct way of looking at it. But it, when you stop developing new, you know, the, the, the Goldberg evo evolution of Goldberg was their claim to fame. As far as new talent, who else in WCW was developed and catered to and, co and cultivated, uh, other than his, uh, famous, you know, the big names, Hulk and hall and Nash and. Randy, that's right. You know, so, uh, they weren't going to give a lot of young guys a chance because the old guys had those spots. Uh, they, they had them, they were guarding those spots like armed guards. So I, I don't, I just don't think so. I, I know there's a lot of politics involved. Of course, the other issue is you can always go back. All of those guys I signed and Benoit, Jericho, Dean, yeah, uh, Saturn, uh, Eddie, they're small guys. In, in today's standards, they weren't small in the, in the, in, in an everyday world, but they were small as in, in pro wrestling size, but here's the thing. They're also, they, they, I didn't know. I don't know that we had anybody any better already in WWE than, than uh, 
I'll put it this way. When we got those guys signed, it made our, our team better. Mm. And that was always my interest. Can we strengthen our team? And we strengthened our team immensely by signing those people. I'm sure that's what you have to appreciate though. Now, though, when you think about Jericho where he's at at 50 or a CM punk or a Danielson, where they come in, they're like, I want to work with this young guy, that young guy, give me him, give me him. It's, it's almost like, like, Hey, we learned from what we saw. Jericho is that way now, uh, working with, uh, you know, he put that inner circle group together and gave all those guys a heartbeat. Uh, you know, those, the folks in, uh, in his group, his faction. And, you know, I see the same trait with CM Punk willing to work with anybody that he believes he can have a good match with and, and as a teacher, as a coach. So I, uh, I, I think that's a, a crucial, any promotion that's not now I see WWE is trying to do that now mm -hmm. they're catching it. Their, their, their NXT show is largely a, a develop a true developmental feel. And they're looking for the next big thing, but so, are, so is AEW, so is everybody else. So is the NWA, so is MLW, well, all those places they're looking for the next big thing. And you never know where you're going to find them. You never know how you're going to find them, you know? So you always can have your short list and mentally, but quite frankly, it's a, uh, it's a constant search every right. day. You're looking for the next big thing. Well, moving on here, Jr. it's the Jericho Regal feud. They're at WrestleMania. They face off for the Intercontinental title in the opener. And from the Observer, Chris Jericho pinned William Regal in seven minutes and eight seconds to retain the Intercontinental title. Match was fine in some ways, well wrestled by Regal, although Jericho had one of those matches where he was slightly off on things. Where it ended up disappointing is that it was just too short. Regal yeah. did a double arm superplex off the top. Regal stretch, uh, but Jericho made the ropes and came back with a lion salt for the pin. Crowd wasn't ready for the match to end. He gave it two stars. Time. And that's not the talent's fault. There yeah. and to, quite frankly, that match, uh, the match time was seven minutes and change, right? Yes. It may have they may have thought all during the day they had twelve minutes or fifteen minutes. And when others come to lobby Vince for more time later on the card, you have to take it from someplace. And so everybody's a victim in that regard. JR Chris writes the same thing in his book that you said the time, the match wasn't bad, but I think it could have been so much more. My biggest problem with it was the lack of time we were given mania took place in the Houston Astrodome and the walkway to the ring was so long that by the time we got out there, we had about seven minutes for the entire match. We did our best, but it was rushed and we were off on certain spots. Even though I won in my mind, I was Oh, and two in my mania performances. Later on at the after show party, Vince complimented me on the match and told me how much he liked it, but I wasn't buying it. I was feeling pretty down on myself and I knew I could do better. Was, uh, was he dealing with some confidence issues, lack of push? What, what, what are you thinking at this well, point? Well, he just, he kept being challenged. You got to still prove to us. You could be a top guy and maybe someday you'll attain that. And through his, he was just dogged. Uh, he, he saw it in himself what he thought could be a major superstar, a WrestleMania headlining guy. And he just knew that it was, it was going to be a rocky road. Do you remember him? Uh, was he having any conversations with you at this point, Jr. or around uh, this time frame? Yeah. And all I could do is tell him, cause I didn't know what the direction, the creative direction is going to be. And that's what his issue was. Yeah. So I could not directly solve his issue. Well, here's what we're going to do in two months. We're going to do this. And in three months, we're going to do that. We're going to culminate with this. I had no idea what that was going to be because quite frankly, uh, booking was done. Unlike the old WWE where you're booking long-term, uh, and it was a scenario where, uh, you know, you just got to be patient and not let your foot off the gas. So all I could do for Chris was just reassure him. Don't, don't, uh, get out of shape on wh where you are. Yeah. Just make sure that every match you have is a head turner and solid and you're giving Vince what he wants and making it a little bit better than he even perceived it would be. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that was the scenario for me. Just, I, I talk to Chris a lot. I talk to Chris now every week, which is, is kind of one of the fun things about being an AEW. I, I, I get to interface a lot of the talents, young and old. 
uh, and I enjoy doing it. And I want to you know, give them cur- encouragement and positive reinforcement. So basically that's what I did with him. Positive reinforcement. Don't give up on yourself. We, a lot of us really believe in you. Just keep doing your thing. And eventually if it's meant to be Chris, it's going to happen. Well, we're about to get uh, going on the whole WCW thing and the split brands and all that good stuff. Did Chris ever mention during this time not wanting to be uh, presented as a WCW wrestler or or have his history brought up about you know that he worked with the company? Did he ever mention that? Not, not that I recall. If he had, it would have been a short conversation because all all that would mean, Paul, is let's re let's revisit history. Hmm. You can't change history. You can study it. You can learn from it. You can't change it. And so that would always be part of my dialogue with talents like that. Continue to do your work. Be patient, uh, in an impatient way. Be patient. The fact that there's nothing you can do anymore than just go out and have great matches and always be hungry for the next step up. Well, Jim, there's uh, some big things coming off this WrestleMania. You have the Austin heel turn. Rock disappears. So, you know, you had the lack of, of top level baby faces. When do you think Jericho is recognized to be put in that type of position? Are, are they starting, you guys starting to think about, okay, are we going to turn it on for Chris? Now he's our guy. Let's put some juice behind him. There's more dialogue, positive dialogue about it, about that time, because, you know, contrary to his, uh, uh, you know, uh, dis- disappointment in the seven minute match he had against Regal, uh, you know, he, he had never had a bad outing. He was reliable. He came to work on time. He's in shape. He helped lay out his matches. Uh, he, but I don't know that there's strong conversation at that point in time. If they, if there had been strong conversation, then Paul, probably the evidence of that would be, he has been booked in a higher profile match, uh, other than the intercontinental title match on the opening match, right. Uh, at Russell, at, at WrestleMania. So, uh, I. I'm sure there was some dialogue, but I don't think it was prominent. And apparently it's going to take some time, uh, before he gets his elevation, because he's going to be downgraded a little bit by triple H Hunter is going to pin Jericho for the intercontinental title on SmackDown. And later on that month at the backlash pay-per-view, which we, uh, you and, uh, Connor, I covered recently, uh, for ad free shows, he and Austin will win the tag team titles as well. But by the way, Jr. before we get to a uh, backlash, Chris Jericho and William Regal are going to compete in one of the silliest matches in WWF history. And I'm going to read the notes that Dave Meltzer wrote in the observer. William Regal pins Chris Jericho in 12 minutes and 11 seconds. And what was billed as a Duchess of Queensberry match complete with a matronly looking woman dressed as a Duchess at ringside playing a cross between Vince McMahon and Jacques Rougeau and doing a gimmick of changing the rules as they went along. Match was fine as far as the work, but it got silly in a hurry. Jericho had Regal pinned after the line salt when the Duchess signaled for the bell, claiming it was the end of the first round. Regal used the Regal stretch, but Jericho made the ropes. Then when Jericho got on the walls, Regal tapped, but it was announced that submissions aren't allowed under the rules. Regal then hit Jericho over the head with the Duchess scepter, Yes, I said scepter and was DQ'd. Of course, it was then ruled that there's no DQ under the rule and the match continued. Regal finally ended up with his face in the Duchess crotch and did his priceless facials. Jericho threw her into the ring and put her into the walls and Regal nailed Jericho with three chair shots and got the pin. This is one of the most unique matches in WWF history where the gimmick is never done again. Thank you. Jesus. Is this a failure creatively in your mind? And does it hurt Chris and Regal at all? Well, yeah, it's a failure. The, the idea didn't, didn't get over. Uh, I don't know that, uh, I think, uh, I think, I don't know that the announcers myself, or I think Paul Heyman was there with me at that time. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure we knew the, what the fuck was happening. Yeah, I didn't, I don't think we knew. I don't think we had. Nobody clear. And I, and that tells me that the rules were still being discussed leading right up to match time, the concept. So I, I, I don't think it was a, it was obviously not good creative. Like you said, the proof in the pudding there is if it had been good, 
then there would be more of them. Right. It never occurred again, but it didn't do Chris and Regal any favors. It's almost like they both had to individually hit the restart button and, and get back and trying to build something. And that had to come off the stinker like that. It just takes a little time to get the stink off of you. Yeah. Talk about the stink off you. Whoever ended up in the Duchess crotch. So you heard it here first from Jr. He is not a fan of the Duchess of Queensbury match. So there you Correct. go. You could say that safely say that in all honesty. Now the plan as, as, uh, for Jericho is, uh, that himself and Benoit were to be built up as number one contenders for the tag team titles. And, uh, my goodness, it's going to be him and Jericho versus Austin. And, 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 and this is the, the breakdown here. We have, uh, the gauntlet match at judgment day, uh, with, uh, Benoit and Jericho against Austin and triple H. And then they split it into individual feuds with Benoit versus triple H for the intercontinental title and Jericho versus Austin for the WWF title. Is this how you remember this all playing out? Yeah, it was fragmented booking. Yeah. Tag angle for a while, single angle for a while. You know, the, the, the thing I, the, my saving grace to keep my sanity was the fact that I knew that it, no matter the combination thereof, the matches were going to be good. Right. The, the fan who paid their hard earned money to come watch this stuff. It's going to be, they're going to be entertained. And I think that's, I think, I think we had at least accomplished that. Was it the most, again, the most fortuitous route to get to this destination? Not sure about that, but uh, nonetheless, that was the road everybody was traveling. And so we all just tried to make it work. You mentioned Paul Heyman earlier and talk about how he's, he's sitting there at the broadcast. He's fresh, uh, you know, on the creative side, ECW has closed down. Is he uh, a big proponent of Jericho at this point? Are you hearing, you know, him talk about Jericho and, and how big of a fan he is? Well, yeah. Well, you know, I talked to Paul a lot because we were partners and we sit out there in the afternoon on Mondays, go over the show and the talent and all that stuff. I, I found that anybody that had a successful run in ECW, Paul Heyman, uh, was supportive of, and, um, uh, and I can understand that and I can see no different, but also Heyman has got a great eye for talent. He's proven that time and again, he's proven it. Now he's making Roman reigns, mm. one of the biggest stars in WWE's recent history. Uh, so I'm sure, you know, Paul had high hopes for, uh, all his guys, just like I have with all, with, when I see guys, I sign that are still working. I have a soft spot in my heart for those fellas. And ladies, some of them, most of the men. So, uh, you know, Heyman was very, uh, and, and he, and he, Paul and I had, a, we didn't agree on everything, obviously. And we had a lot of rivalries on the air that people thought where we hated each other. We never did. Uh, he knew how to be an antagonist. I knew how to be a protagonist. Uh, I, I think we complimented each other. Well, we had a good, good, good run. And we were good. For, I say that egocentrically, perhaps sounds that way. We were good from the get go, but the thing people forget is that we had already had several run throughs. I worked with Paul and WCW because the booking committee didn't want to use him on any role. And I said, well, I need a partner. So I'll, I'll take him. And, uh, we had some good broadcasts in WCW. You know, a lot of things we did were, uh, was, was good television. And that's because of Paul's creativity. And the fact, he loved being a villain. And he's so easy to, dis to dislike. So I, I would say Paul, yes, was a big proponent of all those ECW guys and all those guys we've talked about had a pass through. Mm. They were in ECW. They were Paul's guys for a while. Yeah. So he was, uh, he was, he was fond of his guys like he should be. Well, Jim coming off the uh, tag team gauntlet win at <laughs> judgment day, one of the most historic matches in WWF's history, probably the greatest two on two tag matches in raw history. If you haven't watched it, we highly recommend you do the two man power trip of triple H and stone cold face off against Benoit and Jericho. And I'm going to read this ex excerpt from uh, Jericho's book. And this is what he says about it. He says, so we're in San Jose for raw. The four of us spent a few hours with Pat Patterson, man. There is the key right there. Yep. He spent a few hours with Pat Patterson, putting together the match. We wanted it to be the ultimate roller coaster ride. A match jam packed with twists and turns that would play with the fans' emotions and lead to the two Chris's standing victorious. 
First off, the crowd was amazing. They've been waiting for someone to bring down the two-man power trip and sense that Benoit and I were the guys to do it. As the twists and turns unfolded, the crowd got louder and more voracious. The two-man power trip got the heat on Benoit until finally Hunter gave him a pedigree behind the ref's back. I evened the score by drop-kicking Hunter from the top rope, which enabled Benoit to make the smoking hot tag. I came storming in and dismantled the two of them until finally ending up with Austin in the walls. Hunter ran in from behind to make the save, and that was when disaster struck. When he planted his foot to nail me, he tore his quad completely off the bone. People yeah. often ask me what happens when somebody gets hurt in the course of the match, and the answer for the most part is nothing. The first thing any of us thinks about is simply finishing the match and dealing with the consequences later. Hunter followed me to the floor and tore the top off the announce table where he was going to attempt to pedigree me as planned. I noticed he was limping gingerly, and when he pulled me onto the table, I asked him if he was okay. He says, no, my leg is fucked. When one of the boys says he's hurt, you know he must really be hurt because right. most of the time he'll just shrug it off. Not this time. I was supposed to block his pedigree and turn it into the walls, which would aptly direct pressure onto his injured leg. What do you want to do? I asked, ready to improvise if necessary. He said, put me in the walls, forever earning my respect. He was in a lot of pain, and even though he knew the submission would hurt him even more, he still wanted to put the match first and go through with it. That, dear readers, is a tough mofo. As I slowly <laughs> turned Triple H over on the announce table, trying to apply the loosest walls of Jericho ever, ever inside the ring, Austin hit Benoit with a stunner. I let go of Hunter's leg as gently as possible, ran to the ring, and pulled the referee out by his leg before he could count to three. Yeah, Austin, that's some heavy stuff right there. This man. is crazy. Austin well, and I, yeah, I. I'm right yeah. there at the announce table. I, I know yeah. the pain Hunter's in. I yeah. can see. Uh, He's a tough bastard now. I'm telling you that was because he was in, yeah. he was in amazing pain. You're front row to all this. Oh, all, yeah, right there. Austin and I fought back and forth until I finally hit him with the lion salt. As I had him covered, Hunter staggered back into the ring like Jason Voorhees. How he was able to do that, I have no idea. And he went to bash my brains in with his dreaded sledgehammer. I moved at the last second and he nailed Austin in the stomach. Benoit then tackled Hunter, forcing him to take in another bump. And I pinned Austin for the dramatic one, two, three. The Calgary kids were the new WWE tag team champions. JR, you can feel the excitement of the match through Chris's words until Hunter gets hurt. You can feel the excitement in your call until Hunter gets hurt. The reality of the wrestling and the fiction of characters compared to the actual people don't come together that often in a big way like it does here. What do you remember of this night and having a front row seat to all of it? Well, it was very guttural. It was very... Uh it was distressing to watch that, uh, you know, you knew that triple H was hurt and of course didn't know how badly worst case scenario is kind of what you always go for. Well, the worst case scenario would be he tore his quad. Well, that's what happened. Mm. And uh, you know, the quadricep from Morris for you, uh, uh kinesiology buffs <laughs> is the largest muscle in the body. The forehead wow. quadricep from Morris is a <sighs> means a four-headed thigh muscle. And when that, all those, uh, attachments that the connector connectors, boom, go, I can't imagine how much it hurt. Mm. I really can't. Uh, but, uh, it also led to arguably one of the top four or five, uh, pops I ever heard when triple H returned yes. to wrestling in the garden garden. Yep. That was stunning. It was uh, shocking. And it's like, it's like, you know, like, it's like somebody gave Bruno the, tr the, uh, Fountain of youth because he, nobody in the in wrestling in the garden was ever more loved than Bruno San Martino. Uh, you don't, if you're selling tickets for nine years and then another year or two, or so 11 years altogether, whatever it was, you're pretty damned over. And, uh, you look, go back and look at the list of opponents that Bruno worked with and had good matches with, and they, some of those guys were not good workers. They were safe workers and they were big because Bruno was under six feet. Ironically, and that's something, uh, mm. so, uh, I, I, I had a great deal of respect still do for triple H. I know his, his health has been a point of conjecture in the last several months. 
I certainly hope that he's uh, feeling better and whatever his issue was, uh, as being, uh, as being addressed. I'm sure that it is. Uh, so I can only wish you my best for him and his family. Uh, but yeah, that was, a, I, I think that was a shocker to a lot of people. People were trying to figure out how in the hell do you beat Austin and triple H cause in the locker room with the boys, you know, well, it's gotta be a DQ brother. Uh, I don't can't lose my push brother, all that horse shit. If you're a great worker as everybody professed to be in that booking, you figure out a way, you figure out a way to lose and losing is not the end of the world. Like I said earlier about people losing their jobs, it is not the end of the world regroup. And so I, 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 that audience, I remember that audience there. Uh, and it was like shock and, uh, it was just, you know, things were, things were happening that, that, uh, weren't planned. I love it when that happens, but not to the extreme nature of somebody tearing their quadricep. Right. So, uh, but I thought it was shrewd booking and the key guy, you mentioned it, Pat Patterson sat with them for that afternoon and had to, had to navigate and to mitigate all the egos to get a story out of this thing and a lot of great spots. That's Pat's thing. Pat was a great high spot booker genius. So, and, and, you know, he was a genius, so, uh, he's missed. So, uh, in any event. That's kind of where I left that deal. It was a very traumatic day. You know, as a head of talent relations, I just lost another star. That, that's exactly where I'm headed with this. So Hunter's out for a long, long time. The show's got must go on. And I have to, let's talk about this. Rock's gone. Hunter's gone. There's a lack, lack of uh, top tier talent. The next night, the very next night at a SmackDown taping, it's decided to have a TLC match with very little hype, by the way. It's between yeah. Benoit and Jericho, the Dudleys, Edge and Christian, and the Hardys. I mean, there's a lot. Is this like a, a ratings pop? Is that what we're trying to go for here? Or you know, this desperation kind of booking, together. Paul. Yeah. Desperation booking is all that was. Yeah. You know how do we where, where do we go from that last encounter that where Triple H got hurt and Austin was on the losing team? So uh, yeah, it was just a it was a little little knee jerk, no doubt. But here's the other thing. On the on the other hand. You're not going to put the Dudleys, uh, and the Hardys in a match of this nature and it not be good. So you knew at least for the audience sake, they're going to enjoy what they're seeing. And I thought that, uh, those guys also turned it on, uh, you know, was it on the same level as, uh, some of the other great TLC matches where you added edge of Christian to the mix and all that good stuff. I don't know. That's subjective. That's your opinion. Whatever you think is what it is. Then you'd be right. Your opinion's right. That's right. Uh, so we all have them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the beautiful thing uh, about this. We're allowed to have our own opinions. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, they, uh, it was a little knee jerk booking and they went to tried and true. Unlike this Duchess of whatever match, the Duchess of Queensberry. Yeah. That, that never showed us this, this reared his ugly head again. You went back to something that had worked in the past there you go. in a TLC match and the audience was sold on it because they. They'd seen some of them and they totally enjoyed them. All we're hoping to, to do is keep the momentum rolling for our, for our team. And we, we didn't, and here's the, here's the irony of this thing. I can't understand. And you always got to prepare for the worst case scenario. As I mentioned earlier, I can't understand why we didn't have people in the, in the on deck circle ready to take that one step up or over or whatever you want to, how you, how you want to term it, uh, to be that missing baby face that we're, that we're losing. We're not going to replace triple H seamlessly, but it, it, we didn't provide the opportunities to have people ready in case something tragic happened. We, when we had, when Austin got hurt, we had a guy named Dwayne Johnson that we never missed a, missed a beat. But you know, those don't grow on trees and rock had left to go explore his career, which is he's done pretty damn good at it. As a matter of fact, last I looked, I'm proud of him. So, uh, you know, I, I, that was a, that was bad. That was a creative malfunction. We, that was a, that was a, we weren't doing any long-term planning and that's why we were, the TV seemed to be written hours before they aired. 
and that's not the best philosophy. Well, here we go. And this is a philosophy I'm going to ask you about. It's decided to shelve Austin and Jericho's feud and to include Benoit and make it a three way type of feud. Was this the right move in your mind? I'm going to share some of Jericho's thoughts with you here sh shortly. I don't know why we needed to do that that quick. Uh, what, would it be good? Yeah, of course it'd be good. Uh, anytime you can add a healthy Austin to Benoit and Jericho, how can that be bad as far as mechanics of the match is concerned? But I, I think it was another one of those issues where it was just a little bit rushed and that was more of the norm then than it should have been. And I don't have a 10 reasons why, or look, the company's run by one guy. That's what he wanted. He was convinced that this is what we should be doing by either his own, his own creativity or somebody sold him on the idea. I don't know, but it wouldn't be sold him on it. Cause I thought, again, you, we, we, go, we run to those giving matches, those tr the triple threats, and the ladders, all these things. And we didn't rely on good old fashioned, fundamentally sound pro wrestling. And one of the reasons for that is our chairman was not a huge fan of old school, fundamentally sound one-on-one -on -one wrestling. It was too wrestling for him. As he said many times to me, that's yeah. too wrestling Jr. Okay. I thought that's what we did. Well, but apparently not in his eyes. Well, Jericho is going to talk about this. He's going to talk about it in his book about this whole, why all of a sudden they felt the need to move Benoit and, and to make this a three way instead of go him and Austin at this point. And he talked to Connor out about it again on the podcast that they did together. And Chris said, I was disappointed in the whole scenario, because if you look at this, me and Chris were baby faces once again, and they needed baby faces to work with Steve Jericho recalled. And for whatever reason, Vince lost faith in me pretty much instantly. Then they bring in Benoit and lost faith in Benoit pretty much instantly. Because if you look through that time frame, Spike Dudley got involved and Spike Dudley ended up in a little bit of a feud with Steve Austin. So even though Benoit and Jericho are challenging for the title, Spike's got all the promo time. Spike's got all the steam. It was really, really weird. I remember thinking like the second week after the match was announced, I said to, to Chris Benoit, like we're done. Like he's already given up on us. He's got spike in there doing all the stuff and not us. And I was really disappointed. What was it about Chris that made Vince constantly give up on him or at least made him feel that way? I, I don't know, Paul. I don't know. I can't keep going back to his height. You know, he may have thought Chris didn't have the, the championship charisma because he wasn't over the top. He was a uh, very basic, very real. I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. I wish I did know the answer, I guess, for sake of the show and other things, but, but Vince uh, never whispered or made a side comment or anything well, that would maybe you think ben Wall, so he's, he's, he, we talked about Benoit and Vince's eyes being bland. Okay. And, uh, too bland to be a torch bearer. Jericho was never accused of being too bland. I just think that, uh, you know, personality conflicts, hell, I don't know what it was. It could be a lot of things, but again, you go back and look at it and I gauge the stars by how well they perform bell to bell. And you, you kind of convince me and, and, and you can bring your lunch to do that. Cause it's going to take you a while. I, I'm not going to ever believe that Ben and Jericho would you put him in the ring and ring the bell. They're not going to have a good match with whomever and, and whatever. And that was kind of a blessing and a curse of those two guys. If somebody had a wild hair and creative, a creative meeting. And, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, Vince would go off with some of these crazy stipulations or premature stipulations. Uh, you know, he, I knew the only, uh, my, like I said, my only salvation was for me, I knew the matches were going to be good. Was it good for long-term planning? No. And the reason it's not going to work is you get to two of the great workers, uh, that had not had their cup of coffee at the top of the, at the charts yet. And Benoit and Jericho. And, uh, you had three baby faces in the match cause no matter what Austin did to rock at WrestleMania 17, that's what we're following. Then, you know, the, at the Astrodome, uh, it's not going to, it's not going to work. Yeah. So, uh, cause Austin was not going to be a heel. 
So everything's there's missing pieces and, and there's miscasting in, other words, in, the, in, the, in the old re pro wrestling vernacular miss bu miss booking booking was off the wrong people were playing offense and wrong, wrong people were playing defense, so to speak. I think it's important though, as we go through this, because again, you're head of talent relations, you were one of the Vince's right-hand guys and Jericho's pretty passionate about it in his book about thinking, Hey, something's off here with Vince, but, and you're clearly stating in your mind and what you heard and what, you, and as you were there in the office, you heard nothing directly from Vince at any time as to why he would doubt giving Jericho the ball at this point and letting him run with it as an individual performer. So I'm glad that you stated that. Cause I think that needed to be out there and, and share. I, don't, I don't know why it happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, it could have been somebody whispering in Vince's ear. Uh, Chris could be outspoken. He didn't hold back when he had something to say and how he, he was not intimidated by expressing himself. So, uh, and that always didn't flush well with Vince over the years, not, not a foolproof deal. So, uh, that may have something to do with it. I don't know, okay. but, uh, nonetheless, yeah. it's just, uh, still a mystery to this day. Understood. Well, Jim, we've made it to the middle of the year. It's June 24th. We're at the continental airlines arena in New Jersey, and it's the king of the ring and it's Jericho versus Benoit versus Austin for the WWF title. It is Jericho's first shot at the WWF title on pay-per-view. And well, here's what Chris Jericho had to say about it from his book. Once again, I thought the match was the shits. The dynamic is terrible. Two baby faces trying to fight a heel for the title. And Vince didn't want Chris and I to have any disconnection or any issues between us. So basically Austin beat the two of us, the so-called top baby faces clean. Okay. Remember Austin's heel here. I thought it would have been much better off if they just sort of stuck with me and Steve, you could have had Steve beat me clean, whatever. That's fine. Then he could have gone over Chris done, whatever you're going to do with that. But at least we would have had a chance to go one-on-one -on -one with Austin as the champion. And even as the baby face, if you lose to the champion, it's still a total match. It's still a main event, but yeah. Vince didn't see it that way and didn't see Jericho and Benoit as being main event baby faces. Apparently. Well, there we go. The mind of a madman. This is uh, Benoit's I, I, last match for a long time. He's going to have neck surgery and the invasion yep. really jumps off as Booker T interferes and puts Austin through a table, creating a dynamic of the WWF champion versus the WCW champion. But after all that, Austin still wins and Jericho is in no better spot than before and probably worse off. It's tricky to make everyone better from a creative spot, but was creative doing anything for Chris at this juncture? Well, you got, you got a, uh, a territory that has, that was built on baby face champions. Uh, I said earlier about, uh, gorillas nine year or gorilla, God bless him. Uh, uh, Bruno's nine year run or 11 year run total baby face, uh, Bob Backlund, baby face, Pedro baby face. You know, uh, and then he, it's just, it's a territory that was built on baby face champions. And now we're going to try to make Austin a baby or heel, which never got over. Right. And, and still be the leader of the pack. So the roles were conversed, you know, uh, reversed. If, if anything should have happened, of course, Steve wasn't going to go for it because he was being a heel was his idea. Uh, I'm sure he would have been, you know, he's sat down and going through all the, Steve's not was a team guy. He just had strong beliefs of his own judgment. And, and he knew what he thought was best for stone cold better than anybody else. And I would say that was probably accurate. Uh, but to have, to have a, a, a lukewarm heel at best, and if people are still wondering what happened to the old stone cold, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? So. It was a, it was a, it was tough booking. A lot of masters were trying to be served and it was counterproductive. And, uh, Jericho, as I said, would be better off if he had turned heel and you would, and again, we got back some really good baby face versus heel matches. To me, that is still the most compelling thing. A, a baby, a, a, a heel versus a baby face where the personal issue involved. And if you got a hot title, not just any title, 
you got a hot title. You throw that in the, you, you season the soup of that as well. I'd use the JR's all purpose seasoning, but that's just me. There you go. <laughs> like it. I like how you weave it in there. Well, the invasion starts. It's in full swing. And surprisingly enough, through all of it, Chris is treated as a top WWF guy, which is odd considering the way he's been portrayed uh, throughout this year. Let's it's, not forget, too, uh, Paul. Ben Wall's making seven figures now. Yeah, good point. And he's not got a bad life. Right. He, yeah. yeah. He's, he's not starving. Really, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. And Ben Wall. I remember the exact spot I was standing in Atlanta when we got the results back on the latest, uh, cat scans and MRIs and all that stuff on Benoit's neck, which is pretty much wrecked. Uh, and that was probably just wear and tear over the years. Uh, but he was very worried about what we were going to do. And, you know, there's a clause in the contract. I think that if you're unable to perform your duties and, uh, it might've been six weeks or three months or something the company could either terminate you, which I never was for that. And, or, uh, they could extend your contract. So what we decided to do, uh, was to get the, the, the surgery for Chris that took the, about a year to heal. Mm. There was another surgery he could have done that had taken about four to six, but it's a temporary fix. So why do that? Why cut on a man's body and spend the money for surgery and it not be the final uh, remedy. And I remember standing in Atlanta and I told him what I was going to do. I said, by the way, uh, you're not, you're, you'll get your check every week. There's not going to be any cut and pay. Uh, you're going to get paid mm. like, you know, and I, I remember this, he started crying. Chris Benoit started crying and he grabbed me. I thought he was going to give me a, something like a belly to belly overhead or something, you know, but I've never been squeezed that hard in my life. Mm. Seriously. Uh, it was just a an amazing emotional moment. And, uh, I'm really glad that we handled it that way. I thought I might get a little pushback from the bean counters. who were trying to influence Vince on budgets and stuff like that, but it's, it was, it'd been the wrong thing to do. Vince realized it was the wrong thing to do or even consider. We never seriously considered it. And Chris got every check got paid every week, all his medical bills were paid. So we did the right thing. Uh, it's just too damn bad that, uh, he had to have the surgery to begin with. Sure. Well, the invasion storyline is, uh, as I said, Jr is in full force. And you know what, as, as you're telling that story about Chris and the bear hug and, and it just goes back to, and you were sharing what, what you're dealing with and it just. To me, there in a world where you just hear of things that are always wrong and people not being supported, not feeling supported, and you mentioned before, you've not always not been in a position where you felt supported. How much of a difference it can make in someone's life when you do feel supported, when you do feel? Yeah. Oh yeah, that, that's huge, man. That that's life impacting. That's a big. Hey, I deal. wake up every morning in this cancer battle, thankful that I have a boss that understands mm. my plight, and he also understands more than perhaps anybody. Uh, in an administrative position, how important the pro wrestling business is to me and how much I don't want to hang up my, my, uh, my headsets. So, uh, and Tony knows that Tony's been a fan of my work for years since he was a, you know, a kid in junior high. And, uh, I told him before to his face long before this, uh, cancer thing popped up that this is, I want him to be my last boss. I don't want, I don't, I'm not looking for, if I, if I got released, I would not be out knocking the bat and knocking on the doors of another, of other companies right. to see if they had to work for me. You know, you know, Paul, I'll be 70 in, in January. So it's not like I'm a spring chicken. I still can do what I do. I think at least my ego tells me I'm still pretty decent. Uh, am I as good as I used to be? Probably not. Do I mispronounce a word or two every now and then? Yep. And we love uh, you for it. You know, so what the hell I, I am what I am and I, and I blemishes and all man. Yeah. That's just the, that's just the, the, the hand we're dealt and the, the life we lead. So but that was a situation there. Uh, Chris just had to steer the course. That's right. I can't explain Chris the booking to you. I agree with your philosophy. This doesn't really make a lot of sense. But it's, it's the plays that the coach wants to us to run. I am going to run the plays. I suggest you have the same attitude. 
outwork everybody, outperform people, and never let your memory or your image vanish from television. The good news for Chris Jericho is the story for him didn't stop in June of 2001. We go on, and it, and this is a, 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 it, it continues on for him. Part one of the bigger moments in the invasion. It's Chris Jericho and Kane. They're teaming up against Mike Awesome and Lance Storm, and uh, they're part of the WCW faction. When here comes a crowd into the ring, you got Rob Van Dam, Tommy Dreamer. They attack him, uh, in it's in Atlanta. You have Rhino, Taz, just incredible. The Dudleys, Raven come out to make the save. It's a huge moment. And my goodness, they take out Jericho and Kane. And of course, by the end of the night, the alliance is formed when Stephanie announces she's the owner of ECW. And they yeah. merge with WCW. And what in the figgity fuck is going on, JR? This is when it all hell broke loose. Well, it's all out there to study. You can figure it out in <laughs> hindsight. You're a better man than me. And look, the idea in principle was good. Uh, resurrecting a brand and trying to get traction back uh, was good, I think. Uh, I thought the same thing on the WCW uh, Alliance deal, uh, or WCW involved, was uh, not a bad concept. But it's much like the draft, the WWE draft. I'm not a big fan of the draft, not because I got my feelings hurt and I got moved to SmackDown when I was told the night before you were not, we're not going to break up Matt and summer. All you think are crazy. Uh, and I foolishly, foolishly enough believed I was being told the truth. Not quite. Mm. Uh, and I, I think that I think the ideas were good. I think the, but you can't do the, the thing like the draft where you have, well, I'm on SmackDown, but I'm going to be on raw and I'm on raw. Then I'm going to be on programs. going to be the SmackDown person. That shit's confusing. And if you don't live it, like most fans don't live that, right? It just doesn't make any sense. So, uh, I'm a big believer that their draft and all that stuff would be better if they keep, if they build the two brands and don't have so much intermingling, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. What's the point so, of a draft? If we're just going to still intermingle, yeah, it's, yeah. still logical, still logical. So anyway, uh, I liked it, but I, I the ECW, uh, jolt added a lot of energy to what we were doing. And I think it motivated the talents too, because, you know, ECW was either you loved them or hated them. And I signed all those dudes. I, I always liked them, but a lot of the talent in the locker room on WWE did not like them because it, they proved to be competition. That means you got to get off your ass and work a little harder to keep your spot. And, uh, so, you know, that was, that's kind of where we were with that deal, but in principle, the ECW stuff and the WCW stuff I thought was both very good. And by the way, if done correctly, this is something that's not really talked about a lot. Listen to this at the invasion pay-per-view team. WWF would take on Booker T Rhino diamond, Dallas page and Dudley boys in the main event of the highest grossing non WrestleMania pay-per-view in WWE history. As much as the storyline is maligned as it should be. Uh, that in and of itself should show how much money there would, would have been on the table, Jim, if this was done correctly. Am I right? Yeah. Politics, politics, <coughs> ECW was, look, was looked down upon as a second rate deal. Yeah. And I mean, Jericho stated that he made more money for that show than any other non WrestleMania show. Is that all directly correlated to pay-per-view revenue, Jr.? Yeah, hell yeah, of course wow. it was. They wouldn't pull that money out of our ass and pay somebody because you're a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, that if you did, that'd be amazing. Okay, yeah, go ahead. It's going to happen. Yeah, he earned. He everybody earned their money on that. I, I would tell you, Paul, if the guys would be honest. Yeah, that many of the talents on that show made more money on that pay-per-view mm. than they than they had ever made in their career. Unreal. And maybe subsequently it never again came to that number again. So, but that passion, it had emotion. You had great storytellers. You had guys, you know, like I said, the, the Dudleys and Taz and bully Ray three and, and Devon. Yeah. Uh, all those guys were passionate and it bled through the television. 
So it was a pretty cool deal. Uh, it was, man. As, a, as an ECW fan, I remember the era living outside of Philadelphia. That was a cool moment when Heyman gets in there, cuts the promo, and it's like they're all kind of back together again. You know, right. it's, it's kind of fun to see. It fit. It yeah. made sense in the moment. So now can you, do you have the talents to get in the ring and culminate the story, put a bow on it? Hell yeah, we did. And I was, I really admired the fact that, uh, the, the, the WWF guys by and large, there's still going to be some animosities, jealousies, insecurities. Uh, they rose to the occasion because the ECW guys came to work. You know, you can hear, I listen to busted open radio almost every day. Or I, I listen to it either. I might not listen to it live, but I listen to it every day at some point as a rule. And you can hear the, still the passion in Bubba Dudley's voice. Oh yeah. When he talks about the ECW years and I'm, I'm that's like me getting on a tangent, talking about mid South, you know, mid South was doing the shit that ECW did later with the juice and the gimmicks and the chairs and the violence. And I'm not saying that that to put down or sequester the, uh, the concept that ECW was a copied mid South. I know that Heyman was a fan of the mid South. And I know that, uh, uh, we were kind of rugged. A, and a lot of those ECW guys were fans of mid South. Oh, sure. Oh yeah. We're so, going to get back to some mid South, some AFS bonus stuff pretty soon here. Me and you're going to watch them together again. Yeah. I'd like to. Well, going into SummerSlam, Jericho is programmed with Rhino, which gives him a big win as he's able to renew his rivalry oh, and chemistry with Stephanie McMahon. In the run-up to the SummerSlam, Jericho and Rock cut promos on Rhino and Stephanie, and it leads to a couple classic moments. Jericho showing off uh, the difference between Stephanie's chest, mocking the SummerSlam theme song of Let the Bodies Hit the Floor, compared to Stephanie and saying Let the Boobies Hit the Floor. And then I Rock, been, I, think, I think she'd been enhanced. Yeah, during that period of time, and it was f fairly. And buddy, I was here ev for evident. it. Yeah, no, I'm sure you were. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. And then Rock drops a motherfucker live on TV. What do you remember of this and the reaction backstage to it? By the way, when I read these notes, I well, he's the Rock. I said the same thing about Flair and that stupid ass uh, uh, plane ride from hell thing. Yeah, he, he's a made man. And you can slide on some things. And, uh, that's what I kind of say about the rock. He could do no wrong. Yeah. It was, a, it was a, it was a slip. It wasn't scripted, but that was one of the, the, the beautiful things about his work, rocks work. And a lot of the guys, they, when they got to a certain point in all, of autonomy and success and had Vince's ultimate confidence, you could, you could stub your toe a little bit, still get by with it. I think even he, we as fans are probably a little bit more forgiving for guys of someone like the rock versus if it was somebody else too. It, it's sad to say that, but that's the reality of how people are and think yeah. oh, it was the rock. He's okay. Well, uh, it's not okay. I know, but, but he's still the rock. That's how we justify and, and, it. Yeah, and he made it. He made a, he made a boo-boo boo-boo. That's all made a when mistake. Was, yeah. What do you want to do? Fire Things happen. That's right. When is it decided that Jericho would turn heel on the rock? By the way. I don't know when it was decided, but it was a smart move. You don't want to, you, you don't need a baby face match involving the rock rocks, formulaic way of working his system is, is a uh, crowd psychology to me all worked better when he became a hot baby face and he was quite hot for a long time. Mm. So, uh, you don't, you don't, and, and quite honestly, Jericho's not the guy you want to protect in that, mat, that situation. You're going to protect the rock, right? He's, he's, he's paid a lot of bills and, uh, again, he's a made man. So I, I, I don't think that that was a, I don't need, you know, I thought I read the notes. I forgot about that being said, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, Jericho would turn, uh, turns on the rock at the end of the tag match and Jericho documents this in his book. And he says a week into the program, agent Jerry Briscoe, who had accompanied Jim Ross when he came to Tampa to recruit me several years earlier took me into a corner of the arena to have a private conversation. And Jerry said to Chris Jericho, you've got to really step it up, Chris, because there are people on the inside that want to see you fail. True. They don't believe in you. They're burying you behind your back and telling everyone that you're the shits meet the new boss. Same as the old boss. 
Wow. How come Jericho is constantly dealing with this in your mind? I mean, he's up against it. Well, he's outspoken, it. Paul. He's not, he doesn't, he doesn't go quietly into the night. Uh, he's got a great mind. He's intelligent. He points out these uh, faux pas that nobody wants to hear. Mm. And he's not any, he, he's unrelenting. And sometimes, you know, like I said, he was not, he was not a popular hire. He was with me. He was with the box office. He was with the bottom line, but there are talents there that do that. If he was on his game, we got to get off our ass to, to keep our spot, keep our place in the pecking order, because he's going to bring his and what he's got is really good. Well, he really ramps it up as a heel with his promos and it culminates at no mercy where he goes one-on-one -on -one with the great one for the WCW title. That's right. Rock is the WCW champion. And all those years removed from being told he's not a top guy in WCW, he defeats the biggest star in the industry to win the WCW title. This is from The Observer. Chris Jericho won the WCW title from The Rock in 23 minutes, 44 seconds. The crowd was electric before they even locked up, almost like Rock Austin from Mania. They needed to bottle this crowd and take them out on tour. Jim Ross brought up some of the great title events in St. Louis history and they were throwing out names like Kaniski and Briscoe and Flair. For some reason, Jim Ross brought up the Black Scorpion. <laughs> Flair, <laughs> Flair was Black Scorpion at the 1990 Starcade in St. Louis, which somehow I didn't think quite fit into that category. Heyman said the WCW title dates back farther than any title in the sport. Rock used a rock bottom through the Spanish announcer's table. Jericho blocked a rock bottom in the ring, but was hit with a spine buster. Rock set up the people's elbow, but Jericho blocked it and put on the walls. Rock nearly got to the ropes, but Jericho pulled him in. Crowd was ready to explode for a clean finish, but then wasn't the story. That wasn't the story for today. Stephanie shows up, throws a chair in the ring. Jericho knocked her off the apron. Rock hits a DDT, then throws Stephanie in the ring and gave her a rock bottom. Jericho gave Rock a reverse Russian leg sweep face first on the chair for the pin after the match rock grabbed the chair, but instead of hitting Jericho with it, handed it to him. This one got four and a half stars. And I got to ask Jr. was the black scorpion reference a rib on WCW. Well, it was a little smart ass remark by me. <laughs> it had no validity. You know, when you're sitting out there doing live television and you have no net, uh, it's fun. Yeah. You, you have wing to it, say some stuff. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. Especially with me, especially nowadays. Cause I got right. a free, I got a free tablet to type in what the hell I want. I uh, love it. Cause Tony trusts my judgment and, uh, and I, and he trusts my partners to, to respond to my craziness at times, uh, in kind. So yeah, it was a smart ass remark. I saw it. It had no validity. This match feels like it was the star making deal that Jericho needed at this point. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. You and beat the rock without my you know, goodness. That's, that's a big deal. And it, that for Chris's confidence that gave him validation that I've made it to a large degree and, uh, you know, what else can he do, uh, to get more over? So he deserved it. And, and what I was suggesting to him along the way, be patient, keep putting out the best work you can, even though some of the booking is going to be the shits. That's not your call. It's not your call. It, and you may be right, but it's an argument. You can't win. You can only be a shit disturber perceived. Uh, if, if, uh, if, 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 if necessary, and there's no reason to be that way. Uh, but that was, a, that, that made him big. That made that, that put Jericho on the map. And, uh, I think it was, I think a lot of people thought that there's no way the rocks going to lose the title of Chris Jericho. And do you remember rocks? He was apparently, I guess, obviously had to be good putting Jericho over no feedback in the back or anything about that. No, no. Oh, hey, hey, look, the, uh, Jericho had his detractors and as I, cr I, uh, credit to professional jealousy. Uh, but, uh, by and large to the, to the general populace. Chris was a very popular guy because the talents all knew that they were booked with him. They're going to have a good match, including Dwayne Johnson. Dwayne Johnson did not have to put Chris over. 
they could have worked out something else like rock beating Jericho and then move on to something else, but that's not what the company wanted. And rock was certainly accommodating and was willing to play team ball. And he did. And it worked out great. Well, after this match, Jr. Jericho writes in his book that he, uh, as he does uh, an interview with WWF.com and says this, I'd like to tell Eric Bischoff to fuck off and you can print that. <laughs> It wasn't the classiest of statements, but I felt such vindication. And I was still angry at Bischoff as I'd heard after I left WCW that he had told people that Vince wouldn't know what to do with me and I would be a colossal failure in the WWE. Now that I was wearing Bischoff's own title and Vince's company, I wanted to shove it right down his throat. But instead of telling Eric to fuck off, I should have thanked him. After all, if he hadn't let me leave WCW, I never would have ended up as WCW champion. Is this uh is this a lack of maturity thing or does this bother you? What are your thoughts on on this out of Jericho here? Well, he had a lot of he, he had a lot of uh penned up pent up yeah. uh, you know issues. He needed to and we're hearing that more in in today's world about people getting things off their chest, expressing themselves, don't hold it in, all those things, right? Yes, sir. And uh for your own mental health. I think he felt at that point in time, he had a case to make and, and he was going to make it. And, uh, unfortunately, Eric got the, the sharp end of the stick on that deal. And, you know, but yeah, I enjoy, you know, Eric does a great job here with 83 weeks of Conrad, uh, and I, Eric and I are good friends and, and uh, we weren't always, I'm sure if you ask Chris Jericho today, are you friends with Eric Bischoff? He'd probably tell you, well, sure. But at that point in time, he look back at that situation and where he perceived that Bischoff was not going to give him the opportunity to be great and be a stop, top star and replace a hall and Nash or Hogan or whomever, uh, you know, he's, he's just not gonna, he's not gonna, he had an opportunity to, to express himself and to cleanse a little bit. I think that's all that was. It was good for his mental health. Yeah. As they say in the moment, there you go. Yeah. Without a doubt. Rock and Jericho have a rematch a couple weeks later on Raw where Rock regains the WCW title back from him, but there's an incident where they run out of time and Jericho rushes a chair shot on the Rock that really hurts him. Vince is pissed and gets into it with Chris Jericho in the back. Uh, was Chris prone to kind of shooting himself in the foot? I mean, you see the Bischoff comments, then this. Is this, is this is poor timing? What are your thoughts on this whole deal? Well, he's feisty. Yeah. He's spirited. He's very competitive. That's his personality. And so as a booker or administrator, you, you look at and, and clearly define the strengths and weaknesses of this individual, not just in the ring, but his, his, uh, his mental approach. And, and that's just Chris just being Chris. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that, I think that, uh, that was one of the, one of the aspects that Vince always would bring up that Jericho's uh, is, is challenging to deal with. And he wasn't with me, but here's the thing. Vince allowed Jericho into the Vince's office. He allowed the conversation to develop. The only advice I ever gave anybody talking to Vince is never confront him, converse with him. Simple. Well, by God, I'll can all confront him. Okay. Okay. John Wayne, take it easy. Uh, stupid. Don't be stupid because we don't need any stupid people anymore. It's already here, uh, developing more stupidity. Uh, but that was where I, I saw that, that situation, Vince and Jericho, but uh, you know, you gotta look at Vince. He gave Chris that platform to express himself. And I don't know what the hell they said in their meetings because I made sure I stayed away from them. Yeah. I didn't want to be a party to that stuff. I didn't need to be a party to that stuff. Cause what am I going to, whose side am I going to take? the talent that I hired are the man that's paying me. So why don't you just remove yourself in that scenario? And cause you know, both of them are going to follow up with you with what you are expected to do next. That's right. Well, Jr. we made it to the fall. It's survivor series time. The invasion is put out of its misery when team WWF defeats the Alliance and kills off the WCW ECW Jericho is part of the match teaming with rock taker, Kane and big show to defeat Austin angle Booker RVD and Shane to vanquish them. Well, not so fast. 
shows uh, that uh, the faith Vince had in the alliance when 60% of the roster is from the WWF. So now you have two separate titles. All right, here we go. We have the WCW title and the WWF title, and it's decided to merge them and create the undisputed title, and it's to be determined at Armageddon. In your mind, was there any chance at this point that Jericho was a player for this title? No, but knowing Vince and how he likes to spring surprises and and, and throw the breaking pitch when he thinks that you think it might be the heater, Ricky, you know, uh, no, I, I, I think the but Vince had enough confidence in, in Jericho plus the fact that the talents in the, involved in the match had confidence in Chris and they would go to Vince and say, Hey, I, I don't have a problem with Jericho. He's a hell of a worker, Book me with him. So, uh, that's kind of where I, I think that how that worked out, but there's just no way in hell somebody could, could forecast. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, Jericho is going to leave here with a title. Well, here we go. Let's paint the picture. Let's set the scene. We have Steve Austin as your WWF champion. We have the rock as your WCW champion. It's determined that a tournament will be held to crown the champion and Kurt angle and Chris Jericho are the other two competitors decided for it. Let's use a hypothetical here. If triple H is healthy and not injured, is there any chance Chris Jericho has the year he is let alone to be put in a position to win this tournament? Well, there's a chance Paul, but not as big a chance as Hunter. Uh, if Hunter had been healthy, cause he probably was the obvious choice. Let's not downplay cause he married the boss's daughter and he's a controversial figure and all that dog shit. He's a hell of a hand. He was a hell of a hand. And, uh, for somebody that was booking the live events, the house shows as I was, uh, uh, you know, I, I just know that we, we weren't going to be able to replace triple H very easily. Uh, he was in his prime, he was hot. So I, I would say if I was booking, I would say triple H had been the guy had been, he'd been healthy, but he wasn't. And Vince had built enough confidence with the support of the talent. And his little, uh, run, Vince had a lot of, uh, had a relationship with Chris, much like he had with Shawn Michaels, they were combative, but they communicated often and sometimes loudly and, and certainly confrontationally. And so I think, I think Vince kind of like a fly to the flame, moth to the flame deal. Uh, he, he likes that. He likes confrontation. Even though I said this moments ago, don't go to his office and be in confrontation mode. That just doesn't make any sense, but also don't lay down and die. He don't like that either. So be honest, be respectful, be professional, but tell your side of the story. Not what you think he wants to hear. Mm. Two weeks before vengeance, Jericho is scheduled to put over Austin clean in the middle of the ring on raw. When Jericho brings us up to Heyman. Heyman tells him to just do it and put on the best match you possibly can. At this point, is it already decided Jericho is going over to your knowledge? Do you have any knowledge of this at this point? Uh, I think Vince is probably the only one that knew what he really wanted to do. But a lot of us, because of the on again, off again, false starts, things of that nature, didn't know that, you know, that Chris would be offered an opportunity. Okay. So it was kind of a surprise. But, but Heyman gave Jericho the same advice I've been giving him. You know, don't you here, here we are, you know, God almighty, don't make this pro wrestling and, and, and all of our ignorance and, and our insecurities and all that shit, man, let's go do your gig, do your run the play, score some touchdowns, get in that, you know, let's go. And so consequently, uh, that's kind of how it ended up. And I was happy to see it. Jericho writes in his book that a week before Armageddon, Austin tells him congratulations and that he's going over for the title and that Jericho is beating Austin in the main event to win both titles and become the first undisputed champion is in your, in your history and your experience, JR, is it customary for a wrestler to tell another wrestler that it's not unusual. Okay. No, it's not unusual. There's no conspiracy here, Paul. I know we want to discover one or create one here for just curious ad free shows.com and good old Conrad, but no, there's, uh, Steve, had, Steve is the kind of guy that would go to Vince and say, what's the finish going to be simple as that, man. And, uh, and, and in other words, Austin wanted to put on the best Austin's limited too, uh, uh, health wise. 
Right. You want to put on a match that he and have time to construct a match that he could execute. So, uh, that's, that, that's not unusual for, and, and for Austin had complete access to events anytime he wanted it. So what we're going to do, I need, I'd like to get this match in my head and Vince told him what he'd like to do. And he, I, at that time he was measuring Steve. If Steve had shown any pushback, the match would not gone down that way, but he didn't Steve like working with Austin or excuse me, Steve like working with the Chris, Chris Jericho. Yeah. So, you know, here's another fun little tidbit. Jericho tells a story that Vince confirms this the morning of the pay-per-view when Jericho walks up to the undertaker and Vince says, you can tell that the business is going down the toilet when we're going to make Jericho the champion. Why do you think Vince enjoyed playing cat and mouse with Chris compared to a lot of the other talents over the years? He just loved them. He just Cause he knew it got to him. Yeah. Chris yeah. sold it too vividly. And when Vince sees you, sees you selling, that's what, one of my mistakes over the years. Uh, he knew I wore my feelings on my sleeve and, and he took it. He looked at that as a, as weakness and he, and he, uh, and he took advantage of my passion in some of those areas and to his credit, I didn't need to overreact as much as I did. I didn't want to be a participant. Uh, you know, I didn't want to get beat up on TV every few months. I didn't want to get juice for guys every few months. Uh, I didn't want to be embarrassed and humiliated by the talents. Uh, I didn't think it was the right thing to do. I didn't think I needed to be in that spot. Give that time to somebody that's going to be in the ring and draw you some money. OJR is not going to be in the ring and draw you any money. Even though we did pretty good. The, what killed me in that deal was very simply the technology. The frigging minute by minutes. If my seat, if my, my little pieces of business in the ring were, uh, were, uh, you know, not getting any ratings, I wouldn't have been on television. And the reason I was on television so much is because people, it's like watching Daytona. They're not watching. He's going to win the damn race. They're just saying he's going to crash. Mm. They knew I was going to crash, but how, what, how's this wreck going to be orchestrated? So that's kind of where I think about that. But, uh. You know, but that's just Vince being Vince being Vince. He's Henry. That's why he had such a good relationship with Jericho at times. And that's why he, uh, tolerated Shawn Michaels bullshit at times. And over all those years, you know, Vince and Sean have worked through a lot of stuff. I'm glad for that. And Sean's still working there. I'm glad for that. Absolutely. Well, here we go, JR. It's the big finish from the observer. Chris Jericho won what was once the WCW title, pinning the rock in 19 minutes, five seconds earlier in the show. They both, uh, they had both Jericho and angle confront Ric Flair, noting that Flair had never been undisputed world champion. They pushed Flair as a 16 time champion. And that's a very conservative estimate. Rock did a rock bottom, but couldn't follow up. Vince came out and distracted the ref missing the pinfall. Rock punched Vince and hit a spine buster on Jericho. He set up the people's elbow again, but before delivering it, threw Vince in the ring. He hit the elbow, but again, no ref. In the confusion, Jericho hit a low blow and pinned Rock with his own rock bottom finisher. Meltzer gave it four stars. And then on that Great. same evening, Jericho won the WWF title from Austin to combine both belts. That match took 12 minutes, 33 seconds. Angle immediately hit Austin with a chair shot and rock gave Jericho a rock bottom just before the bell rang to start the match ref bump by Earl Hebner. Jericho did a low blow and missed time stunners. Austin went down late. Vince again comes out with Nick Patrick before he could make a count. Flair comes out and Dex Patrick Vince punched Flair and posted him taking him out. Austin used a low blow and a Boston crab. Jericho was tapping like crazy, but again, no ref. Booker T runs out of the crowd, hits Austin with one of the belts while Vince throws Hebner into the ring to make the count. And it was, uh, the finish live, uh, from what uh, Meltzer said here was flat, but it got three and a quarter stars and man, that would be it. We would have our first undisputed, uh, world heavyweight champion. The ultimate irony is that Vince kept shitting on Jericho, telling him that he was the shits. And here we are. The first time that WCW and WWF titles are unified and it's Vince McMahon holding the belt up with Jericho on the ramp. Very unique way of motivating somebody. Very unique, very unique way of, of, of uh, uh, you know, of motivation, tough love, if you will, mm. 
and uh, Vince knew how to manipulate Chris, and get under his skin, and Chris was going to return in kind. And by and here's the here's how you want Chris to do. Have the attitude, okay, asshole. I'll show you. Right. I'll show everybody. Because I can work with the two top guys in the world and hold my own and have good matches. And he did. He did. So Vince made the right call on that, I thought. And uh that was his way to get in the head in a in a positive way, as crazy as it may sound, uh, with, with Jericho. It it motivated him. He had he had to keep proving himself. And he did your, uh, thoughts on having Vince and Booker and all these guys running in and, and all that, not my well, cup of tea. Yeah. Not my cup, of, not my drink of choice. Uh, I'd like the wild West feel, but only when it's used sparingly because then it, then it'll be more effective. Uh, but I thought, you know, I would have kept the heat on Vince cause that was a proven deal. You know, McMahon is a heel. This McMahon was the greatest heel in the Attitude Era, period, mm. in my view. Uh, I'll argue any point of that with anybody. Uh, and the guys he gave the rub to was is uh, numerous. But I thought he got a little, a little bit convoluted. And along the way, they're going to use that opportunity, Paul, to give rubs to others, like Booker T, for example. I got no problem with Booker T getting a rub, but I don't think it was. I think that might have been the wrong place. This didn't feel right. It felt too convoluted and a little bit forced, uh, with Vince and Stephanie out there and, and all the stuff she went through and, you know, and then Vince making, doing what he did as a, as a villain would have been enough for me. Jr. you said from day one that Jericho would someday be the man. Was this his crowning or was it just right time, right place for him and his turn? Well, I think it was his coordination. Okay. I, I think that he finally achieved the goals that how many guys in that locker room, Paul, do you think would like to have had that finish and, and we had that them. opportunity? Absolutely. Every damn one of them. That's right. So Vince ha- found respect for Jericho very late in the game, but on that night, uh, Jericho's greatness was underscored. He beat two of the most famous individuals in the history of pro wrestling in the same ring on the same night. And that's pretty damn heavy. As we wrap this one up, let's hear what the man himself has to say. Chris Jericho, right from his book. He said the body of the match was hard hitting and solid, but the finish was a train wreck. As you said, Jr. not my cup of tea. It made about as much sense as an episode of lost and boasted a almost as large a cast. Ric Flair, Vince McMahon and Booker T joined rock and angle and running in. Each one making my win look more like a fluke, which was the last thing I needed. I needed all the booking help I could get to be a credible champion since my name value and status was far below the other three guys. Instead, I beat the rock using his own finish after interference and then beat Austin by hitting him with the title after John and Kate plus eight ran in to assist me. (laughs) (laughs) I love him. Oh, that's fantastic. But the fans were nonchalant and didn't buy it. Even as Vince raised my hand and a blizzard of confetti and streamers drifted around all of us. It was the biggest moment of my career. And the San Diego crowd was as silent as a fart in church or however that saying goes. Oh, you got to love the, the, just the rawness of Chris Jericho, but he got there. Yeah. Was it our, an artistic masterpiece? No, but the, uh, him winning. Two ma- two major huge stupendous yeah. matches in one night still you know, brings maybe, it up. Yeah, I, I think some like the uh, some people, some fans, the diehards have, have a propensity to over evaluate, over analyze uh, matches. You know, and I I don't uh, I don't I don't I don't buy into all that shit. It's just too negative and unnecessary. But I, I can't see how. Chris Jericho, uh, left the arena that night, not feeling good about himself. Was it finished? What he would like to do at per- perfect world. No, it was too convoluted. Too many people in the, in the scene, too many people cast in the scene, even walk-ons and, uh, you know, uh, but that he didn't have any control over that. 
You're absolutely right. Looking back on it, it's a monumental moment in wrestling. He brings it up even a lot now in AEW. I mean, he the, he won the both championships, undisputed champion. And uh, this is the beginning, I think. And would you agree of the legend of Chris Jericho in your mind? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, absolutely. Whether he liked it or not, or I liked it, or you liked it, or Meltzer's readers liked it, or whomever, it doesn't matter. That's right. He still got the results that he was looking for as far as leaving uh, as this undisputed champion and nobody in wrestling history could go back and say, well, I was the first. No, you weren't. There's one guy was the first Chris Jericho. And to me, that's a career win. That's a career win. Uh, and I think it's, it just kept launching him to more great things. And, and, and we're seeing it now mm. he's, we're seeing he's, he's 50 something. What is he? 51, 51 this week. Yes, sir. So I guess I got to buy a gift. I'll get, I'll give you some sauce. There you uh, go. Yeah. He's got seasoning and sauce. Kids. Yeah. He like he likes it. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I appreciate that. But in any event, he's, uh, he has nothing left to prove. I, he's into AEW because he still loves what he does. He loves helping people and making them better. You think Santana and Ortiz haven't learned from Chris Jericho and, uh, Jake Hager. That's right. You know, uh, it's just Sammy Guevara. You can tell he's under his wing under Jericho. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. It's like Sammy's in a, in a great spot. Sammy's been booked very well, slow, but sure wins the race. So I, I'm a big, big, uh, believer of that, but, uh, yeah, Jericho's he's still, he's still on top of his game. He's he'll, on many he'll, people's. He'll, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say that if that match on, on a Saturday night in Minneapolis, at full gear delivers like I think it will. I think it's going to pleasantly surprise a lot of people because how many pay per view uh, main event level matches has uh, Dan Lambert's crew been in? None. None. And and uh, how long has it been since uh, we saw uh, America's team uh, on a hot streak and 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 win a bunch of matches and get build momentum? Never. So all that is under the orchestration of Chris Jericho. That's why I think the Saturday night's match will be much better than people perceive it might be, and especially considering the lack of experience of so many participants in, in that, uh, in that big tag team matchup should be really interesting. JR, we are closing up 2001 Jericho closes 2001 in the rocks hometown in Miami by defending his title in a three-way against the rock and Kurt angle. He gets the win. After Angle is DDT'd uh, and Rock on a chair, he DDT'd Rock on a chair, gets the win. And that wraps up 2001. We hope uh, you enjoyed 2001 20 years ago. He was 31 years old this week. He's now 51. Happy birthday to you, Chris Jericho. We hope you yep. and, uh, enjoyed uh, this story of 2001. What a career, undisputed champion. I've enjoyed working with Chrissy all these years. Uh, I'm always going to be proud of that hiring. Uh, and I just think he's, uh, an amazing, uh, asset to our whole business, you know, him going over and working in, uh, new Japan was groundbreaking as a free agent, as an individual, uh, putting all that together with Kenny and so forth. Mm. was uh, absolutely amazing. It's funny that the Japanese office, the new Japan office didn't have any problem putting Jericho in a, in a key spot, uh, when he had not been in a key spot for quite some time. So, uh, he's a winner and, uh, I know the AEW we're still building and we're still growing and we all know we have to bring our very, very best on Saturday night, everybody doing whatever job, you're a cameraman, you're an audio guy, you're an announcer, you're a wrestler, whatever it may be, the, um, the referees, all that stuff. But, uh, this is an extremely important show for us. Uh, and, you know, start started Wednesday and live Friday rampage live. So it's going to be cool. Well, JR, we have six fan questions and then we'll close it down talking about some sauces and spices. So here All we can right. seasoning. So here we go. Six real quick. We'll go rapid fire. Michael McClanahan says, JR, he's our buddy at free shows. Do you believe it was a good idea to crown Jericho as the undisputed champion during vengeance 2001? It seems like another alternative would have been to hold off Jericho's title win until next year's WrestleMania in Toronto. No, I had no problem with it. Strike the iron's hot. Uh, you know, we knew rock was tentative because of his movie career. So, uh, we, we roll with it. 
And, uh, no, I don't have a problem with it. Would it have been good at WrestleMania? Of course it would have been good at WrestleMania. But was it bad the way it was? I don't think so. All right. Thank you, Money Mike, for that one. Lindsay's up next, our friend Lindsay. She says, do you know the story of Jericho's night after winning the title? Why was he not given notice to have his family there or be able to celebrate properly? Hmm. I don't know that he wanted him there. Does, does uh, Lindsay know that Chris has turned down to have his family there? He's probably not. So I don't even know that was an, even an issue. It may have been his choice. Hmm. And, and, but the, and that time... Think of how old his kids were, his, his twins and his other, other child, you know, come on they're do the math. They might not have been it was 20 years know, ago. So probably none of them, none of them really born yet. Well, some of them were, yeah, I think, but in any event, I don't know that that's an issue. It's somebody looking for a story <laughs> and I don't know the story that exists in that, in that world. Right. Somebody's hunting for shit. <laughs> All right. Next up is our favorite executive producer, Jeremy priest. And he wants to know, I know it's a tough subject for some, but Jericho and Benoit together was absolutely gold. What made them gel together so well? Well, they knew each other like the back of their hand. They had great respect for one another. Uh, they'd wrestle in the formative years, a great deal. Uh, their, their Calgary, uh, experiences, I think was good. So they just, they were, they were. Yeah, they're two great talents and they knew their, they knew how to like rock would say they, they knew their role. I love that. Like the rock would say they knew their role, like rock and roll, baby. All right. Mike is up next. Did Jim hear the story regarding a certain someone with three initials calling members of management, the day of vengeance, 2001, trying to steer creative away from putting the belts on Jericho. So triple H there. Did you hear yeah. a story about him calling? No. Okay. Could have happened. I, I didn't hear it. That would be, he fun would not for the work. He didn't call me. Yeah. Cause I, he knew where I stood on, on that uh, matter. So calling me would have been meant nothing and I couldn't have changed it anyway. There's only one person he would have been calling BKM daddy. If, if, if that happened, yeah. I, I don't even know that it had happened, it, 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 but it does make for good wrestling gossip. Yeah. TMZ. Uh, we have next up Nick Dawson. Was there any thought in turning heel and, uh, Jericho turning heel and joining the Alliance at invasion instead of Austin? If not, what are JR's thoughts on that? Seeing as the old stone cold returned to a huge pop a few weeks prior and Jericho turned heel a few months later anyway. Oh gosh. You know, you, there's a million booking scenarios and, uh, uh, Bill Watts told me a long time ago, there's more than one way to do something right. And there's more than one way to do the situation. So Nick, I don't know what you're looking for. I'm not aware that, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of all that. You're talking 20 something years ago, guys. I can't remember all the, that, but God damn. I, I, no, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> My I favorite more, new I, part of the show is the fan questions. Jesus Christ almighty. <laughs> But you see this, the endless searches that people go on and they <laughs> submit these questions. I, love I it. had no idea we were going to do questions. To that oh, there was, yeah, they're on every episode, I believe. Sorry. So, but I, I don't mind them. Yeah. And yeah. people are curious, I love if it. I don't know the answer, I'm not going to make one up just for the sake of perpetuating just a talking shit story. out your ass. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not doing that. Okay. We'll do one more and let's see if it with this one pulls it out of here. Here we go. This is from Ray LaDuke. Was him winning the undisputed title just a way to eventually drop it to Triple H at WrestleMania 18? Oh well, yeah, getting the title back on Triple H was a was a no brainer. So I don't. And if you're going to do it, you'd want to do it at WrestleMania, which contradicts what I said earlier about waiting until WrestleMania for Jericho to win the thing. So uh, I, call, I call that match at WrestleMania 18 uh, with uh, Heyman. I think it was, no, it was Austin, uh, excuse me, Jerry Lawler was back then. Mm. Cause we called the, I remember the, the, the significance of that show was sure as fuck wasn't the main event. It was, it was rock and Hogan. That's right. Toronto. They had, baby. Yeah. They had to follow that. They meaning uh triple H and, and Jericho. Nobody gave a shit. Yeah. That was the match. Nobody cared about triple H defeating Jericho. Yeah. And it's hard to follow. Those guys are in a bad spot. And nobody also forecast how great the performance and how much the crowd was going to buy 
uh, rock and, and Hogan rock Hogan. Yeah. So, uh, you know, no, I don't, I don't, I think, but that it made sense. WrestleMania 18 made sense. You, you got your title on the line. You got your champion who's been, you know, uh, dinking and dunking and, and, and holding on. And so, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think that was the right thing to do. I got no problem with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, the, the two guys in that main event, triple H and, and Chris whatsoever. Uh, it was really, what else you're going to close with? Uh, and of course I said, well, he should have beat a triple H. Well, why? What for? Well, because I don't like triple H. He married the boss's daughter. God damn. I'm still mad. Eh, get over it. God damn it. God damn it. Barnett was over. I didn't even, bitch. I didn't even get one Jim Barnett in this week. Yeah. We still have a few minutes. Listen, that's it for the fan questions. And man, I wish there were five more. Cause we were getting red ass. The eye started turning red. Like, you know, the Hulk's turn green when he turned, <laughs> oh, I was getting a turn there. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> well, listen next week, Jim. You guys are going to be deep diving into the, one of the subjects that we actually talked through today. It was Survivor Series 2001, the end of the invasion. You guys are going to talk all things Alliance related. I can tell you're super excited. That's going to be a great show. You're going to talk about that bloated roster, the decision to end it all. What? Well, I mean, it's you're excited for that one, aren't you? Well, I'll, I'll enjoy talking about it. I wasn't excited about how it went down. Yeah, good point. You know, I think we cut that angle way short. And what you said about the, uh, pay-per-view buys. Yeah. Uh, uh, why would you want to go leave that? It's because some people weren't happy with it because some people have to share the spotlight mm. and, uh, it, it, it created a new game and apparently some people didn't want to play in the new game and they got it changed. So, but I thought we wait, it was a wasted, a lot, a lot of effort, a lot of wasted time and a lot of really good talent that had the chance to really elevate themselves, uh, weren't given that opportunity because the angle was cut short. It was one of the, I'll say this, the, and you'll hear it with Connie, my yeah. boy. Yes. Uh, I think you'll hear that from me without being overly negative, but I thought it was a huge, huge missed opportunity, yeah. huge missed opportunity. And, uh, but we did it. We missed her. Slicker than slicker than what, you know? Well, that's right. And cheeks will be back next week. And you two can talk all about survivor series 2001. In the meantime, let's talk about some sauces, Jr. Well, let's see, the holidays are coming, man. Yeah, buddy. And don't wait too late to get your orders in and check out those, uh, those gift boxes that we have that have multiple items in it. All of our top selling things are in it. When I was home last time, uh, I signed. I signed a bunch of uh, paperback mm. uh, under the black hat books. I think they're on our site for 20 bucks. Point being is that we've got a lot of unique items. We've got a lot of things that are signed. Uh, and there, we try to keep things affordable. So, uh, I, I just hope people will check out our site. JRSBBQ.com costs nothing to look as I often like to remind. But uh, we sure appreciate your business here at the holidays. Hope you'll make us a part of your holiday fest festivities. Uh, we sure would appreciate it. And uh, you know, we 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 set like, this is like our WrestleMania season. Yes, Christmas for, for, season, baby. Yeah, for my uh, for our site, and that's kind of how we position ourselves. We need a big close. And we need a big finish, and, and all that good stuff. So hopefully, uh, some of you guys are thinking about holiday gifts. Uh, you know, we got, we, we just got a lot of things for the wrestling fan that I think you'll like my, our mugs our uh, our Moscow mule mugs are, are cool. I like, I love those, uh, those, uh, sample packs. They come in a nice box and, and, uh, it's well done. So, you know, that's just where I am. And that's hard for me to, I've been having a hard time getting in the holiday mood because of other issues in my mm -hmm. life, but nonetheless, uh. It's crunch time for the holidays, and we hope that everybody will at least give us some consideration for, for that. Your your tasty products are on my Christmas list, from the seasonings cool. to your sauces, Jr. I can't Good. wait for that to be sitting 
either in my stocking as because they make the perfect stocking stuffer. Yeah, you're right. Main event mustard, some ketchup. They fit right in that stocking. Yeah. And this all per Conrad, Conrad is my biggest advocate for the all purpose seasoning. Oh, I know. And I, I love, we get on a roll on Twitter, uh, where people are sending in what they, the latest thing they use the all purpose seasoning on, and it's pretty damn incredible creativity, yes. taste and all that stuff. So and we got the big containers of it as well. So it's all good. I, 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 I'm very confident that our fan base will reach out like they have the past at, at the holidays. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and make us a part of their, of the holiday season. Like you said, stocking stuffers, you got a wrestling fan in your family. You don't know quite what to get. Cause he's crazy wrestling fan. What do you do? This guy, we like know he's eat. nuts because he's been a wrestling fan forever, you know? So there you go. A lot of us wrestling fans, trust me, I've seen him top guy weekend. We all like to eat. So uh, yeah. you got plenty of that good stuff on your website. That's right, sir. All right, adfreeshows.com is where you can find all the other good stuff and where you want to get signed up. Maybe you're looking for a gift for your spouse who wants to join and be a member and is unsure about it. Listen, we got something brand new, JR, that we've never offered before. Uh -oh. New for 2022. Does that, that nude sounds... pictures of Conrad? New days of my boy. Oh my God. Those cheeks are huge. Wait till you see his other cheeks. <laughs> so listen, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait on that one. I'll let Megan have all that big old ass. All that goes. white meat. So listen, we uh we got a big exclusive deal, okay? You can be a part of JR Grilling JR show like you've never been before in 2022 because we are giving the opportunity to, for folks that are members of adfreeshows.com to help pick the topics for right. Grilling JR next year. That's pretty cool, huh, JR? You can be the booker. That's right. Book the show. Take the pencil from Conrad. Do you get the most powerful weapon in wrestling? The eraser, do what you want to do and send them in. And, and maybe your topic will be selected. And if so, we will, we'll uh, try to knock it out of the park for you. There you go. Remember the big years. We love to do the anniversary shows. So 92, that would have been a 30 year deal. 97 start of the attitude era money. Many would say. That's a 25 year anniversary next year. I'm sure there's a lot of gold you can pull from there. So if you're on the fence about joining ad free shows, which by the way, you get to see video of this podcast, you get to see Jr's face, which to me is the best part of recording with him. Some of the faces cool. he makes, I love it. It's hilarious. So subtle is not my thing. I'm not real subtle. Uh, I, I also, uh, uh, I, I appreciate people listening to on the ad free shows.com. Uh, piece of business, uh, the old WSB radio shows. Bingo. That's a real cool thing that, uh, Conrad was <laughs> able gold. to yes. secure from my friend, Dennis Brent there in Dallas. And, uh, it's really uh, fun to hear the feedback from that people going back in time. Those shows are all live, live. None were rehearsed. There was no scripts. And I had some of the biggest stars in wrestling as my guests on those Sunday nights on AM 750 WSB. Check it out. We have lots going on over there. JR and I get together, do bonus shows, watch along old matches. We mentioned mid South. We're going to do more of that together. And, uh, it's just the place to be. It's a great community. JR jumps on, does some zooms, answers your I'm questions. I'm doing one a week from Friday. As a matter of fact, that's right. You know, week, the, I saw you were on the calendar the 19th, right? Uh, yeah. The 19th, Friday? Friday, the 19th, you're going to be on yep. doing a, a, a Q and a with our folks. I think we're doing it at eight o'clock. I'm sorry, Paul. I think we're doing it at eight o'clock, eight Eastern. Eight Eastern is how I understand it from, uh, uh, who got a hold of me? Was it Lauren? Maybe Lauren. Yeah. yeah. Lauren Yaffe. Yeah, Lauren uh, Yaffe. Yeah. She's going to be Lauren, uh, Lauren only has one suit of clothes and they're all, they're all, uh, gimmick heavy. <laughs> they're all. Yeah. I'm it, not knocking that by the way. No, she's not speaking of knocking. Woman. Yeah. There's some knocking know, going I, on there. I know that she has, uh, uh, she's hot for Eric and oh. Tony. Loves, loves her for some Eric Bischoff and she's yeah. hot for Tony. She likes guys that are 55 and over. Yeah, I'm not in that group. She, yeah, I, don't you are. She, I don't think she'd like, oh, I'm 55 or over. Uh, yeah. But she's, uh, 
She well, her eyes on other dudes, but and she's a happy married woman. Yeah. But how's it, all but, that work? Uh, you know what? I don't know, Jr. but I know they all, there's a long line. It's like the deli counter over there. So it's, it's <laughs> just pull your number. Yeah. Anyway, we're having fun now. I'm going to get in trouble, but it's all good. She'll host it with Jr. and it's a blast. Listen, that's the community over there. We have a great time. We're yeah. all friends and it's a great community to be a part of. It is, indeed it is. And we appreciate everybody's business, their support. Uh, and of course, well, Conrad will be back next week and he better be, be right. Good. Jim Paul, Ross like him. I've had enough of this guy this week. You did a great job as always. You're prepared and you listen. And that's one of the great marks of a good broadcaster. So you have ability to listen and then, uh, translate what you hear into a, a story that has continuity. Well, thank you. So yeah, you did a good job and I appreciate your efforts. And, I uh, so Conrad called me late in that day and said, you know, I got a, a double book myself. And I said, well, how about where's Paul? Get him in there. That's Bring right. him out of the pen. I love it. I appreciate you uh, being so cool with that because, uh, listen, a lot of uh, Conrad's the man and I'm, uh, I'm just here to help him. It's always been my mantra, but I love working with you, Jr. And I uh, appreciate you doing this today, but man, that's going to wrap us up for this week. Check out Jr. go to jrsbbq.com. Get you some salsas, get you some seasonings. We love and support you here at the show. He's Jim Ross, the voice of wrestling. I'm Paul Bromwell. We'll see you again next week right here on Grilling Jail. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.